How are you? I'm fine, thank you. A very good morning to everybody. Um, I perfect, perfect, perfect. To to our experts, I can confirm now that we are live on YouTube as well. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you so much for taking time to join with us today on this uh, 21st edition of the Fakara Masterclasses. Today we will focus on Aedes mosquitoes and Anopheles chifensai. As we get ready to start, I would like to invite you to kindly uh, mute your microphones and your videos, except if you are our uh, uh, main speakers of the day. Of course, as always, you can ask any question using the chat tool. We have a number of other experts on the line, and we are requesting you, if you have any information about any of these questions, please feel free to engage with all of us on the chat box. Should you have a question that you really, really want to talk about, just let me know, and or Sheila, and we will invite you to talk about that. We have a very, very exciting line of um, 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 uh, technical detail, uh, lines of technical details planned here, and we look forward to uh, having an enjoyable discussion with all of you. My name is Fredros Okumu. I am from Ifakara Health Institute. And as usual, my co-host is Dr. Sheila Ogoma. Uh, she works for Chai. Sheila, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Fredros. I'm Sheila Ogoma. I work for Clinton Health Access Initiative. Um, an entomologist. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. And just a quick announcement. We are trying to find uh, Dr. Basil Kamgang in case you have been able to join. Please turn on your video because I can't find your name on the Zoom line. I noticed that you are already here earlier, but somehow I can't find you uh, now on the line. Also, we are uh, paging uh, Dr. Ayman Elamin from WHO. Okay, brilliant. I see that Ayman is already on the line. So Ayman, please turn on your video as well. Uh, to our colleagues, there's uh, 304 people registered for this uh, um, event. Some of them will be following um, on YouTube. We have activated our YouTube channel. I can see already approximately 160 people and counting are already joining us. And we hope that um, uh, we can, as usual, have um, um, a great discussion. Let me check one last time if we have Basel with us. Hey, Basel, can you confirm if you are available? Basel, do we have any colleague from Cameroon? We will be starting in approximately one minute. Uh, sorry, Fredos. Yes, I please. have an issue with my computer. Who is that speaking? It's Basil. It's Basil. Oh, Basil, I have how are you? With my computer, yeah, I'm okay. Okay, so who is? Uh, are you joining anyway? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have an uh, issue. Yes. Okay, but can, but you have joined, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you can you turn on your video? Yes. Fred, it's under the name. It, it, it's Marses, uh, the name is Marcesa Lubert, it's Basil. Marcesa Basil. 
Marcel Sandu. Um, ah, <laughs> bonjour, uh, uh, Monsieur Basel. Yeah. How are you I doing? have an issue with my computer, yes. This is fine. I saw you earlier and then, you know, invited you in, but that, that didn't work. Ah, okay. So, thank you so, so much for joining. Um, uh, and thanks a lot, uh, Basel. So, uh, dear colleagues, I think we now have a full house. Uh, I would like to ask Sarah if uh, Dr. Tabar is joining, Kata. Um, I don't think she could make it, unfortunately. All right, but just in case she joins, she can turn on our video as well. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, so we have um, all our experts in the house and I would like us to begin the show today. We're gonna start uh, with the first, the first section is going to be on Aedes mosquitoes. And this will be covered by uh, 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 Basel and then our colleagues from the Wild Mosquito Program. And then the second session will be on um, Anopheles Stephensa. I'm still struggling to pronounce this name. Basel, how are you? Hi, Basel. Yeah, hi. How are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, Basel, you work a lot in Cameroon and you are probably uh, together with um, uh, our colleagues from Kenya, Dr. Rosemary Sang and uh, Dr. Lutomie and our colleagues from the Walter Reed. You guys are probably the, the best known AIDS specialists in Africa. So we're very, very happy uh, that you're able to join with us today. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Basel, we would like to begin with you uh, uh, just to go over in very brief, um, 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 in a very brief way, what the extent of the, you know, AIDS bone diseases in Africa is. What, how much is the problem uh, that we are talking about here? Go ahead, Basel. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry to be late. I have an issue with my computer uh, this morning. So I'm connected with uh, the laptop of my colleague, Marcel Sande. Yes. Uh, about above virus disease in Africa in general, uh, I, I will start to say that during for the long term, it was considered as case in Africa due to the fact that many abovaries have the similar symptom with malaria and other infectious diseases like typhoid and, and hepatitis also. So uh, now it will be very difficult to have a real burden of abovaries disease in Africa due to the fact that generally it's not a uh, diagnosed. Uh, generally, also, uh, fever in Africa is attributed to malaria, even without diagnosis. Take, take into account to this, it will be very challenging to, to have a real burden of abovary disease in the continent. But we, we can say that but during the two last decades, several outbreaks have, be, have been reported in many countries in Africa, notably in West Africa, in Burkina Faso, which can be considered now is the hotspot of dengue in West Africa. Also in Cote d'Ivoire, in Benin, in Senegal, but also in Central Africa, in uh, in countries like Gabon, in Cameroon, also where some uh, minor outbreak have been reported during the last decade. Yeah, and in, in to complete the, 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 the image that we have here is a publication that yourself and uh, Dr. David Whitman um, have produced. And you, you, you've made these estimates that about two thirds of the African population is at risk of, of an AIDS born disease. Uh, is, yes. is this, how much of an error do you think there is around this? And, and, and about, why is this a neglected? Why are the numbers? The numbers seem so high, much higher than you know in many other diseases. And yeah, yet exactly. People don't talk much about it. Yeah, why is neglected? This is the question. Yeah. Yeah, it's neglected due to the fact that uh, um, malaria is endemic in many African countries, and as I said previously. Generally, fever is attributed to 
to uh, fever is attributed to malaria. Right. And in, in the past also, some entomologists think that uh, Aedes in Africa is not competent to transmit dengue, for example, uh, and so on. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Basel. Just, just for the sake of time, we're going to try and move as, as fast as possible. But before we leave this topic, uh, the Aegis Egypti population in Africa appears to be very similar across the entire uh, continent. Uh, you guys have done some work on the genetic population structure, and I would like us to talk briefly about that. Um, in one of your, your papers, you, you kind of conclude that there is not so much differences between the dengue population, Aedes populations in different African countries. Is this is this right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For this study, uh, one thing need to be mentioned: norm, uh, between, for example, population of Aedes from Central Africa, for, for example, that many of the uh, of this population were collected in silver areas, such as in look uh, in part of the La Lupe in Gabon is a right. sylvan area. In Cameroon also, mosquitoes were collected in uh, in northern part of Cameroon in the sylvan area also. In Yaoundé, in downtown, in some uh, peri-urban area in this uh, location. After the morphological analysis, uh, mosquito collected in urban area can be attributed to Aedes aegypti aegypti. Mm -hmm. But mosquito collected in silver area is attributed to Aedes uh, aegypti formosus. But after genetic analysis, uh, after genetic analysis, uh, we found that species collect in rural area and in urban area is, uh, and forest area is quite similar. This means that in Aedes, uh, in Central Africa, we have only Aedes aegypti formosus, but uh, two so type, the forest one and the urban one. So, so, so Basil, what, are you, what you're saying is, and I think we have a slide for that, is that even though we typically describe this as Aedes aegypti, that there are actually two different forms in Africa. You have the Aedes aegypti aegypti and Aedes aegypti formosus. Yeah. Uh, are, are they are this different species or, or just strains? Uh, it, it, it will be very difficult to say that it's different species. It, it, this can be considered as sub sub subspecies. Okay. But take it into account to the uh, morphology, we can mm -hmm. easily uh, differentiate either Egypta Egypta and to Aedes Egypta formosus by the presence of pearl scale on the first tergit, uh, abdominal tergit in Aedes aegypti aegypti. But this can be done when uh, mosquitoes were collected, uh, when you identify, identify in freshly collected mosquito, because right. sometimes yeah, the, the, the scale can be disappear when mosquito spend a day in the Insectary in the cage, you can be not able to continue to to identify. Right. But this both, both form of has been described uh, partly in Senegal, also in Kenya. Yeah, talk to us a little bit about that because in in the figure that I'm showing here, um, and I mean, uh, this is apparently a very important thing um, uh, given the differences. The figure we're showing here. In Kenya, in, in the in the southern part of Kenya, in the south in the coastal yeah. Kenya, you have this place called Rabai, uh, the, the forested areas there, and it it appears that there are two distinct populations of Aedes mosquitoes circulating there, and they are not mixing. Is this something that is common across Africa? No, it's not common across Africa. It's not common. This was mm -hmm. uh, this was found only in Senegal and in Kenya. Okay. All right. But uh, to definitely conclude about that, I think that it will be good also to 
perform a large study in Africa to collect mosquito in both uh, silver area and urban area. Right. To have a uh, an overview of the distribution of both genetic form in Africa. Right. Uh, but but so a, a follow up question there is since we've had the Zika situation uh, outside Africa and uh, a lot of people have been interested in what is it that makes the Aedes mosquitoes outside Africa so competent in terms of transmitting arboviruses compared to Aedes mosquitoes in Africa. Uh, and this is a conversation that I would like to continue to have with our colleagues from uh, uh, Pasteur Institute at some stage. Uh, but looking at this piece of work which you are also involved in, it appears that there is even greater you know, differences among the Aedes mosquitoes outside Africa than the ones you have in Africa. Is, is that right? Yes. And, and what is it that makes these mosquitoes carry so much disease when they are outside Africa than when they are in Africa? I mean, this mosquito originated from Africa, right? Yeah, we, we, we cannot definitely say that because the, the recent study that we performed in Cameroon, for example, uh, uh, about the vector competence of Aedes aegypti, Aedes abopitius, right. we, it's true that we use only one, uh, one strain of Zika. Mm -hmm. We demonstrate that uh, 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 the cast and Senegalese strain of Zika can be transmitted by Aedes mosquito collective through Cameroon. Right. Yeah. So, so, so uh, the va the variation can be full according to the strain use, the strain of uh, of various use. Right. Some some strain can be can be found less competent than others. Right. Thanks, uh, uh, Basel. You are also known, um, uh, one of the greatest contributions we believe that you've made in this field is, is your work on Aedes albopictus, which is not generally an African mosquito, but you guys have described a very widespread inversion of um, Aedes albopictus in Africa. And it, it would be nice uh, uh, to talk to you a little bit about that at some point. But first of all, um, in very simple terms, if I have, you know, found these two mosquitoes and my colleague Sheila is, is gonna take this uh, over um, um, from here to, to talk about a little bit about your work on Aedes albopictus, how to tell the, them apart and, and so on. So Sheila, please. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Fred. Uh, um, so, Basil, we would like to first of all understand what the differences are between Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti, um, specifically looking at their blood feeding behavior, their resting behavior, um, their aquatic ecology. How do we tell them apart? Okay, thank you for this nice uh, question. Yeah, uh, about the blood, blood feeding, uh, I, I would like to say, firstly, Aedes abutus is considered as uh, an opportunistic uh, mosquito that can be fed on different uh, vertebrates uh, in human, in some aquatic animals also, and in um, some domestic animal like pig, also in silver, uh, some forest animal like uh, monkey and bat also. But uh, uh, Aedes aegypti fit mainly on human because Aedes aegypti is that by the definition is the is a domestic mosquito we live around human being. But uh, near to Aedes aegypti, you have Aedes aegypti formosus, found mainly in the silver area, which feed on uh, animals, like monkey also, and bat also. 
about arresting behavior. This can be very different between what is observed in other parts of the world, for, ex for example, in Asia, in South America, and in Africa. In Central Africa, uh, both species, uh, uh, the, the human outside, outside, and the resting site is also in the vegetation and also the in the inside the user tire, also outside. The situation is very different to what is found in Asia, for example, uh, for Aedes aegypti, which is mainly found indoor and between also indoor. Now about the vector competency, uh, there is a great difference between both species in Central Africa. We demonstrate that uh, Aedes aegypti is generally more competent to transmit uh, dengue, yellow fever, Zika compared to Aedes aboketus. But, but one interesting thing that we found that is for the, uh, that Aedes aboketus collected in Brazzaville in Congo uh, has been found uh, efficient to transmit also yellow fever virus. About the aquatic ecology, uh, generally about what we know, what is known is that Aedes aegypti is mainly is mainly found in water storage container, but in Africa, both species are in Central Africa, both species are mainly found in user tire discarded town, and in some city, you can find also uh, Aedes aegypti, particularly in, in water storage container, and uh, another discarded town. But about the beating preference, uh, in, in Africa, we don't have enough data about the beating preference. But what we observed during our, uh, du uh, during my PhD, I, uh, during my PhD, I other, I, I, I other work that I did in the field, both species, beaten human outdoor, uh, uh, during the, uh, during the daytime, uh, it, Early in the morning, between six to nine, and in the evening between three p.m. and six p.m. Right. <coughs> yeah. Um. I have a follow-up question. So, how do we explain um, the difference in competence? Why is I think you mentioned that Abopictus is more competent. Why is this? No, no, Abopitus, uh, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt is sorry. more competent than Abopitus. Yeah, why it is? Uh, uh, we can uh, uh, have several hypotheses. To address this question, uh, it, it will be good to characterize the mosquito in terms in term of microbiote to assess if there is some bacteria or uh, 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 SX-specific virus that can be, that can compete with uh, the, the virus. This is one thing. Uh, uh, this is the main thing that I yeah, can is say. It, is it at all related to their behavior? To their specific Pardon? behavior like so is, is the competence related to maybe their biting preference or their blood feeding behavior? 
the vector capacity, yeah, I mean, not competence I think so. The vector capacity can be linking to the behavior or uh, blood, uh, blood feeding preference. Yes, vector capacity. Okay. Basil, Basil, before we before we proceed, can you just make a quick confirmation here uh, for us? In in the image we have over there, it looks like there's a virus coming into our Zoom. I don't know what those blue lines are, but Basil, on the images that we have there, the, the face of this mosquito is a single line, and the face of this other mosquito has you know these double lines on the sides. Are those yeah. the main characteristics we use to distinguish between Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti? <laughs> yeah, the land that you show for Aedes albopictus is the main characteristic. So this is the, this for, is the main characteristic? Yeah, but okay. uh, for Aedes unilineatus, uni you have also this, this, this single line, but mm -hmm. it's not when until the presbyterium area. Okay. Yeah, All but right. for it, that is the the two um, two line in form of lear in both uh, in both side. Yes. Okay. Let's let's move on a little bit. And, and we were saying earlier we were talking about the inversion of Aedes albopictus. pictures. This is typically not an African mosquito. This is an Asian mosquito. Uh, you guys have described the appearance of this in, Afri in Central Africa, and now you say it's in the Congo as well. How widespread do you think Aedes albopictus is in Africa? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, first thing to say that uh, Aedes albopictus has been reported in Africa for the first time in 1989 in South Africa and had yeah. be rapidly con controlled. But in two years later, this mosquito has been reported also in, in, in Nigeria. After that, in the in early 2000, mosquito were report, uh, this mosquito was reported in Cameroon. And the Ca Cameroon was the starting point to invite almost all the Central Africa region. Because now, uh, uh, Aedes abjus have been reported in, in all the country in the Central Africa region, except Chad. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the thing to highlight here is that uh, in all this country, uh, in almost uh, in this country, the distribution of Aedes albopictus is limited to the southern part of the country. Uh, the same observation has been done in Central African Republic, where Aedes albopictus have a distribution limited around six degrees latitude north, and right. also in Cameroon. These are interesting points, and I, I don't know if we have any colleagues from, from China or so, because apparently in China as well, you have these latitudinal differences uh, in, in Taiwan as well with pictures and ladies. But before that, let's talk a little bit about the competence. Sheila was asking you about that earlier. And, and I know that you've done some work where you've actually compared directly in the lab uh, the role of albopictus and uh, Egypti in transmission of different albuviruses, uh, and and yes. and there you've shown you've shown that they are very good vectors. Uh, you've also you know conducted an analysis of their blood feeding behaviors. Uh, the question we have for you here is: Is there any field evidence that Aedes albopictus is involved in the transmission of albuviruses anywhere in Africa? Yes. Yes. During the Gabon outbreak, also mm -hmm. in during the Congo out, uh, Congo outbreak, uh, firstly uh, by uh, during the Cong uh, Gabon outbreak, Aedes albopictus uh, was detected as main vector during this outbreak. Because during the the Gabon outbreak, there is a co concurrent circulation of dengue and chikungunya virus. Uh, also. 
after reanalysis, the sample collected during the outbreak in Gabon, yes. some some pool of Aedes albopictus collected was found positive to Zika virus. Uh, uh, during the uh, uh, Congo outbreak, uh, Chikunya outbreak, this time, uh, both species, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, were found positive to Chikungunya virus. Wow. Shella, did you have any additional questions on that? We can move on, Fred. Uh. Uh, okay. Uh, Basil, we, in, in, the, in the figure earlier before, before when we were talking about uh, the aquatic ecology of Aedes pictures, you showed this, you've described these um, tree holes. As a, as a major source, a uh, major breeding habitat for Aedes albopictus. And, you know, in, in, a, in some work that my colleagues have done in Tanzania, so this is the figure from your paper with, uh, with your colleague yes. Gwadney in Central Africa. In some of the work that my colleagues have done in East Africa, they see these tree holes as well. I don't know if you can see it in the image here. You see that? Yeah, yeah. They see those tree holes as well, uh, mostly with the coconut um, and, and having a lot of Aedes. And, and you describe similar tree holes, of course, are different. Um, and I remember a long time ago working with Bart Knolls in Western Kenya, we were seeing tree holes as well. What do you think is the likelihood that there could be Aedes albopictus already in East Africa that is undetected? It's, sorry. Is there, a chance the that, is there a likelihood, what's the likelihood that Aedes albopictus is already in East Africa but undetected yet? Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I, I, I cannot say that because uh, uh, during the uh, malaria anthropological for malaria investigation, Generally, uh, all the mosquito species collected are identified. Is the same thing that has begun to detect uh, uh, abortus in in Cameroon, for example? Right. It, it was during the malaria uh, entomological survey for malaria that uh, yes. scientists detected this mosquito. Okay. Uh, and also the, the, the genetic analyze confirmed the hypothesis that uh, invasion of Centratica uh, by Aedes albopictus can be recently. So, so are you suggesting that malaria entomologists should be actively looking for these mosquitoes as well? Is, is that something that we should include? Yeah. Hey, Basil, are you there? Hello? Yes. I, I Hello. asked whether you, whether you think that, because we have a lot of malaria entomologists in East Africa, do you think they should be actively looking um, for Aedes as well, Aedes albopictus, Aedes aegypti? Yes, yes. Because it's, it's the same manner uh, Aedes albopictus uh, was detected in, in Cameroon, in Equatorial Guinea, yes. Okay. During the during the field survey for malaria work. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Shayla, please. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um... And, and still, still on you, Basil, um, having looked at the, the behaviors of these two species, how then, how then do we embark on, um, on their surveillance? What are some of the parameters that we should be looking at um, when uh, planning the surveillance yeah. of AD? Yeah. 
for surveillance, you have a traditional stegomia indexes that they have been used for a long time for yellow fever, uh, yellow fever survey, also for dengue, dengue, so, dengue survey. We had mainly the house index, which the percentage of house infected with larvae and or pupae of one of both species. Generally, this index was described in the uh, mainly of uh, uh, described in the area where only Aedes aegypti yeah. was found. But in the context where we have both, both species, we, we need to, after the survey, rear mosquito in the insectary until have the adult mosquito and identify to be to, to be able to attribute uh, the, to calculate the index for Aedes aegypti, the index for Aedes abopitus, to to have the, the contribution of each of each species. Uh, this uh, is a really important also when you plan to assess the the, the pupa index. We need to collect the pupae in the area and store the pupae individually in the in the pot after emerging and identify to be able to say during the survey I collect 10 pupae, five for Aedes aegypti and five for Aedes abutus. This can help to have a contribution of each species for risk of for transmission risk yeah. uh, about uh, ad adult uh, survey now uh, is uh, is is a big uh, big difficult to have a, a good trap that can be used uh, in area where ADS Egypta is mainly uh, is is bite mainly outdoor because uh, normally when you read paper for other location, they can tell you that the BG satellite traps is a good trap for IDES collection, IDES field collection. But it look like in Africa, BG satellite traps is not very indicated to uh, collect adults in the field. Now, actually, I try to collect with uh, Procopac traps, which is seem more efficient to collect ADES in the field compared to BD Sentinel traps. So now to to to, yeah. Uh, in, in the resume, what can say to, to assess the density or the entomological risk in one area, it will be good to start by stegomia indexes, after the, followed by pupa index, and when it's possible, you can assess also the density of the adult in the area to use also the six, six trap Human landing collection is no is no longer used at all. It's no longer used. Even when you generally the ethic committee not agree with that. So so Basil, like, what you're saying is that for Aedes mosquitoes, unlike a North Lens, the best approach for their surveillance is to target them in the aquatic stages. Yeah. And only then, if you are unable to do that, that you should look for adult surveys, but those should be supplementary. Yeah, but the, 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 the main thing that until now, it, 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 it'd be very difficult to correlate the, yeah. the, the this index to various <coughs> transmission. All right, back to Sheila. 
Um, so I was wondering, Basil, do you know of any examples uh, where um, AD surveillance has been incorporated or integrated into um, entomological surveillance that is geared towards malaria transmission, malaria surveillance? Just a few examples of where this has been integrated. Um, and I ask this because of the chat that we have in the, the discussion that we have in the chat. Um, should we be looking at combining the two? Hey, Basel, did you hear that? <coughs> Hello. Did you, hear, did you hear the question? Yeah. Please, can you start with the question? Yes, yes. Shela so was, was asking. Go ahead, Shela. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I was wondering if you have any, any examples where um, AD surveillance has been integrated with um, malaria vector surveillance. Uh, no. There is no an example. There is no an example really. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's 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 uh, let's uh, move move forward. Uh, we have one last question for you, Basel, before we begin uh, talking to our mosquito control world mosquito program colleagues. Uh, and, and this this is about um, resistance testing for Aedes. Yes. Uh, you know, we try this many times, and I'm sure many people have tried uh, many times. And uh, there is no clear guidance for this no clear concentrations of which pesticide use. So people tend to just use their Anopheles concentrations from WHO. Is this the right approach? What should people be doing? Yeah, it's true that uh, there is not a, a diagnostic dose for all the insecticide for ADES uh, But for some uh, um, molecule like uh, for uh, Delta Metrin, Delta Metrin, you have the uh, diagnostic dose for this insecticide, which is uh, a, a bit less than what is used for uh, Anopheles mosquitoes. But for other species, uh, for other uh, insecticide, we don't have a diagnostic dose for ADES. In this so context, what? Go ahead. Go ahead. In this context, I think that the, the best approach to use what is existing is firstly to start before if, for example, there is uh, an, an asset if the, con the, the concentration is good or not and prepare other concentration for ADS mosquitoes. Come again. Can you? What is, what is your advice for people doing resistance testing on Aedes mosquitoes? What should they do? Because <laughs> there, there are no diagnostic doses for most chemicals. As as I say previously for permethrin, <laughs> delta methrin, you have the diagnostic dose. Okay. But for the for other insecticides thing to do is do what is used for uh, malaria vectors for anopheles. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think the last question is back to you, Shayla. For, for, for the... Yeah, thank you, Fredros. Um, Basil, I think this is just one last question. Um, what is the impact of climate change um, on the Aedes, um, Aedes mosquitoes, as well as the aboviruses that are transmitted by the Aedes population? What do you see happening, given that what we are seeing in the climate change? Yeah, a very interesting topic and, and question also. I, I think that like some other uh, author predict that is the coming year, abovarus disease 
will be will be the main uh, health problem issue in Africa due perhaps to the climate change, also due to the fact that uh, the, the burden of malaria <laughs> will be reduced and the main ask, uh, and, and the main um, health issue will be the abovirus disease. Which, with climate change, uh, is 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 a whole <laughs> problem. But I, I I I I'm prefer generally to speak to to global glo, uh, globalization uh, than climate change, because globalization globalization take into account uh, several things. The uh, deforestation, uh, uh, improve of uh, uh, improve the, the the travel condition. Uh, this can significantly impact abovirus disease transmission, because uh, even if the the, the viremia period of abovirus is quite low. Which improve of travel condition, people can travel for Hong Kong from Hong Kong to Cameroon in uh, in Tanzania in in twenty five hours. Uh, vectors can travel from Cameroon to to Tanzania to Asia from Asia to Cameroon. That. For, for me, I prefer to speak about uh, globalization than climate change. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Basil. Um, I think to end, we just, on behalf of Shayla and myself and all my colleagues, uh, you have been working on this subject for a long time, uh, you and very few other people. Uh, this is one, of, one area that is very poorly financed, uh, very little funding. Uh, you paid attention to it through thick and thin, uh, and you've worked very hard and generated a lot of data uh, in Africa. Uh, and this will be useful uh, in many years to come. And we would like to say th a big thank you uh, for, for that engagement. Uh, congratulations also for the great work done until today and for all the support you're providing to young students and to everyone else. Uh, um, we hope that you continue to work on this. We know it's a difficult area. It's got very limited funding, uh, but we wish you well. And I hope that you're okay. staying with us on the call because we're going to proceed now to start working also with uh, talking to our World Mosquito Code Program people and then talking about um, Anopheles Stephenfly. But some of these questions are relevant to you as well and you can, you can uh, jump in. Thank you so much, Basil. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear Peter, uh, dear Jeremy, uh, we have lots of questions for you uh, before we jump onto an opposite inside the wild mosquito problem. Peter, are you there? Yes, Fred Ross, I'm here. Uh, Fred Ross. Peter, many years ago, 1950s, we had what we call the world, the global malaria eradication program, never included Africa. Today we have the wild mosquito problem has no activity in Africa. What is happening here? What are the plans? That's a great question, Fred Ross, and I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, part of this, and I think one of the questions that was asked in the first session was, you know, what's the problem with the Egypti, Aedes aegypti, and what's the problem with dengue in Africa? And I think it's, it's, it's relative to other, you know, vector-borne diseases. And I think we recognise that, you know, if dengue is a problem, it probably doesn't, the same magnitude currently of what malaria and perhaps other vector-borne diseases. So we recognise that while we're, we hope that this approach that we're developing could be relevant for a range of countries where dengue is a problem, um, we're very interested in part of this session today was to share information on the program and perhaps gauge whether this approach is relevant for centres in Africa and could it be applied as a public health tool at scale. So yes, we're very interested in, in sharing information, perhaps 
learning from the experts in Africa about whether this tool could be relevant for addressing so, 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 so we shall say that the, the, the framing as wild mosquito program is in anticipation that at some stage they, you will have a presence in Africa too. Exactly, yes. We hope so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's in the United States, they like to call a, a, a baseball, the world best championship. No one else plays. Uh, and, and, and we had the global malaria eradication program and, and never had any presence in Africa. So we hope that this is going to be. Anyway, uh, uh, jokes aside, is it true that at the moment you're focusing mostly on this project time? Yes, and so you know, okay, and what's the reason? The entirety of our program is is using this naturally occurring Wolbachia uh, that we've introduced into Aedes aegypti in the lab over ten years ago, and so experts around the world generally regard um, Aedes albopictus as perhaps a, a secondary vector of dengue. I've heard estimates of ninety seven percent of global dengue burden is associated or transmitted by Aedes aegypti. There's some countries, and you mentioned Taiwan before, that have Albopictus in some areas and Aegypti in other areas of the country. Almost all dengue in Taiwan is in areas where Aegypti is present, hardly any with Albopictus. So I think there's some natural history experiments that point towards Aedes aegypti as the primary, most important one for dengue globally, but that doesn't exclude some areas with Albopictus. So for the program, we've mainly focused on Aedes aegypti to date as our Thank target. You. You see. Thank you. And, and, and you, I know that you, you, together with your colleague, Jeremy, uh, you can jump in anytime. Jeremy, please feel free to, to jump in anytime. We'll just throw the, these questions to the two of you. Uh, your work is mostly, and, and we would like to talk a lot about this today, the use of Wolbachia, the bacteria Wolbachia, named in 1924 after Mr. Wal Dr. Wolbach here. Wolbach, I believe. Uh, what is so special about Wolbach here? It's quite unusual. It's an intracellular bacteria. So most people associate bacteria with a pathogen that causes ill health or disease. So this is a very widespread bacteria, largely in insects. So 60% of insects globally contain Wolbach here but not Aedes aegypti, the global dengue vector naturally. Um, it's quite unique that it's passed in, uh, in mosquitoes from the female through her eggs to the next generation. So it's not infectious in the environment. We can't spray Wolbachia like BTI into the environment and, and kill mosquitoes with it. It doesn't work that way. It's only passed from the female through her eggs in the case of mosquitoes to the next generation. And so um, groups were trying for decades to move Wolbachia from some of its natural hosts, including the fruit fly, in the case of the, our source of Wolbachia, into different types of mosquitoes. And for decades, it was near impossible to achieve that. And so over 10 years ago, we were one of several groups that were successful in moving it from the fruit fly, where it occurs naturally globally, into the Aedes aegypti mosquito. And we had this, what we call a stably infected line of mosquitoes in the laboratory that pass this wall back here on from generation to generation. So we will, we will go through that. And, and I would like us to talk a little bit more about that. Before we do that, uh, we have some slides here on the history of your program. And if you don't mind, I would just like you to, to help us go through that. Sure. Um, um, this, this came actually from your website. So <laughs> it's a little bit of plagiarism on our end, but I hope you don't mind <laughs> if you guys talk in any way. Uh, 1924, uh, Wolbach is first described. Um, uh, uh, Professor O'Neill, who we were hoping would be able to join, but unfortunately cannot join, starts working on Wolbach here. The male pop uh, is described in 1997, and then on and on until 2010, you guys get good bill of health from, from the regulators. Which of at what point did you guys make what you would consider uh, the greatest break until 2010, before we move forward with that? I think it was one of those, and Scott O'Neill described it, he was trying for decades, and along with other scientists, to move Wolbachia well into Aedes aegypti. And, he, and he, I think he was quoted as saying, he burned many postdoc scientists on this over the years, ended their careers of not getting any uh, research papers out of it. 
And then we were lucky. I think it was one of those moments in science where, you know, something unexpected, you know, ten, after tens of thousands of micro injections end up with a handful of mosquitoes that have Wolbachia inside them. So I think there was a part of it was luck. And sometimes in science that comes along. And then I suppose the next finding was that Wolbachia interfered with the, the replication of pathogens inside the mosquito. Um, that was unexpected. There was other insects where it was being discovered around the same time in Drosophila. And so with those two things coming together, a stable infection in Aedes aegypti and the finding, that, which is quite unexpected, that it interfered with the ability of dengue and other viruses to multiply inside the mosquito. And so that was probably the two critical pieces that came together. And that was in 2008, 2009. Yeah. Before Zika uh, pandemic, uh, a lot of activity in your group, but the, the world doesn't know you very well. And then Zika comes and this blows out. So can you describe a little bit how the Zika situation transformed your program? And so we've been working, um, we've been doing releases in various countries um, up until like 2014, maybe five countries had released, including some of the major population centers in, in South America, including in Colombia and Brazil. And so around when Zika emerged, our colleagues um, in Fio Cruz in Brazil tested our Wolbachia mosquitoes and found that they interfered also with the ability of Zika virus to multiply inside the mosquitoes. And so that was a promising result. And so at that sc stage, because there was a dearth of um, evidence-based interventions against Zika at that time, um, limited drugs and therapeutics are available. Um, WHO made the recommendation evaluated evidence that under the Zika emergency, that there could be pilot implementations of Wolbachia yeah. in response to Zika. And so that was exciting and really opened up the opportunity to scale this up across some of the large cities in South America, largely in response to Zika. Yeah, thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the technical detail. And you mentioned some of this already. And I would like us to start from the time when you guys were still doing oral infections before you started the, the micro injections. Uh, uh, and uh, I think this is the first major breakthrough. You mentioned it earlier. Uh, um, yes. uh, Wolbachia syndrome in Aedes aegypti, uh, this first demonstration. Before that time, there was already a demonstration that Wolbachia can reduce the lifespan of mosquitoes. Yes. And, and uh, uh, is it true that an early part of your study, your program was really on that strategy, reducing the lifespan of mosquitoes? That's right. The, you mentioned this popcorn strain of Wolbachia, which is really the our original proposal was to introduce that into um, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And this particular strain of popcorn Wolbachia was shown to shorten the lifespan of uh, fruit flies in the laboratory. And so at that stage, this is 15 years ago, we hoped that that would shorten the lifespan of Aedes aegypti. And okay. we know it's really only the older mosquitoes that are infectious for dengue and similar to malaria. And so if we could selectively kill the older mosquitoes before they become infectious in the environment, we hope to reduce dengue transmission. Uh, popcorn um, shortened the lifespan, but it was uh, it made the mosquitoes quite um, lost a lot of loss of fitness, and so they were unable to compete with wild mosquitoes in the environment. And so it was probably uh, it was too strong a, a life shortening effect. Also, egg longevity was reduced. At that same time, we were injecting other types of Wolbachia, and so this other strain of Wolbachia, WML, which has now become the cornerstone of the program. It doesn't shorten the lifespan of the insect. At, at all, really. Its major effect is to block these other pathogens. So the strategy shifted from trying to shorten the lifespan of adult mosquitoes to try to block the replication of pathogens inside the mosquito. Um, quite a change of strategy there. Yeah, I can see that. But I mean, just confirm, at, at this stage, uh, the species that you're describing there is still the, the what you refer to as WML pop, right? Um, it's, uh, there's, it, Wolbachia is the genus and Pipientis yeah. is the species. It's one, one global species. There's arguments about whether it should be divided up into different species. Um, the WML pop and WML, uh, I suppose you could say they're separate strains of Wolbachia. Okay. Um, Pientis. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, that's 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 um, an, an interesting thing. And I would like us to just keep also for my colleagues joining on the call, uh, uh, Two, two different things, two different approaches here. World Mosquito Program began as a live mosquito, as a program to shorten the life of mosquitoes. 
uh, which is a very common strategy in malaria control, you know, like reduce survival. And, and Ryan, Peter is saying that, you know, by doing that, you introduce a certain fitness strength, uh, 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 constraint in the mosquitoes and they cannot spread the Wolbachia anymore. Uh, sufficiently. And so it was necessary to have a different strategy. Is, is that a good summary? Yeah. That's that's perfect. Thanks, Fedros. Uh, uh, cool. So, uh, Peter, moving forward, um, uh, this is now 2011, I believe, um, is it 2009, the same year, actually, uh, you have this same strain of mosquitoes introduced for the first time in Aedes aegypti. Yes. This was the last just... opening. Hot strain, yes. Yes, so can you describe this? Earlier you were saying that this does not exist in Aedes naturally, no? No, not naturally. Um, this this particular type of Wolbachia was from the fruit fly that was um, in a colony at Caltech for many decades and was shown mm -hmm. to shorten the lifespan of the fruit fly in the lab. And so right. it was a straight transfer from one host to the other. But this was a really challenging technical uh, step. And so Connor McMenamin was a PhD student in, um, at University of Queensland in Scott's group and was, had a team of uh, technical assistants trying to help him to do injections. And it was tens of thousands of injections, um, most of them unsuccessful. It's not surprisingly, um, young mosquito eggs don't like to be injected with a relatively large needle. So most of the eggs die, don't survive. And so the group ended up with a handful of eggs that survived that had Wolbachia inside them and produce stably infected Wolbachia mosquitoes after that. And so we ended up with a colony of um, Aedes aegypti in the laboratory that passed on this strain of Wolbachia from generation to generation. Um, and this work here really describes the phenotype or the effect of the Wolbachia on the longevity of the mosquitoes here. Right. Can you describe briefly this, the, the use of um, uh, tetracycline here? And so Wolbachia is a bacteria and it's susceptible to tetracycline. So we can feed mosquitoes, you know, dilutions of tetracycline and either put it in the rearing water and it can clear the Wolbachia infection from the insect. And so what that does is it creates a genetic control line. So it's identically the same as our mosquitoes with the Wolbachia, but we clear the Wolbachia. So we compare the phenotype, the survivorship and so on. Um, uh -huh. So it goes back to, to normal. Yes. One thing that comes up in this, in this work is this concept of cytoplasmic incompatibility. I have to say, uh, it's been impossible for me to understand until even today. Uh, uh, many, many times I've asked people to explain how does cytoplasmic incompatibility work? What exactly is it? Uh, the best uh, explanation I got from a, a um, uh, communications grew, grew, which I think is from Singapore, and I will show you that right now, just to try and get some additional explanation from yourself. Uh, Peter, or, 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 or um, um, uh, and your colleagues, what is cytoplasmic incompatibility and how does this work with regard to Wolbachia? And so it's one of the three key traits that is really the cornerstone of our program. And what it is, is a mating incompatibility uh, between uh, mosquitoes with Wolbachia um, and mosquitoes without Wolbachia. So for instance, yeah. on this diagram that you have here, you have um, the female mosquitoes on the far left column and the male mosquitoes on the, the second left column. And the colored ones, I assume the green ones are the ones with Wolbachia. Right. And so, if you've got the different pairings, so, you know, obviously uninfected female can mate with an uninfected male mosquito, and then the top one, and all of her eggs produce um, viable mosquitoes. Um, that's the top one. So that's the natural type mating. In the second one there, what you have is a female mosquito, the second row, a female mosquito without Wolbachia, mates with a male mosquito with Wolbachia. And so this is what we call the incompatible cross and so what happens is we're not quite sure what the mechanism is, how this works, but the end product is that essentially none of the eggs from that are laid from that female are viable. They don't hatch. And so what that means that when you have a lot of male mosquitoes in the environment with Wolbachia, it's causing a lot of infertility in the females. None of their eggs are hatching if they mate with those infected males. 
whereas the last two rows there show the infected female mosquito on the third row and on the fourth row. Infected females can mate with a male that doesn't have Wolbachia or it has Wolbachia and all of her offspring are viable and they all inherit Wolbachia. So it's that second row there is what allows Wolbachia to spread into insect populations, this incompatibility. It effectively gives female mosquitoes with Wolbachia a reproductive advantage over her uninfected sisters in the environment without actually being Wolbachia being infectious. Um, yeah. It took me I, I, don't know about, I don't know about my, my colleagues, but I still don't understand it. Okay. <laughs> um, it it's, chal it's challenging to understand, but this, this concept is quite, it, it occurs in mosquito species uh, and a lot of insects naturally in the environment and is what has, has allowed Wolbachia to, to sweep into insect populations without actually being, you know, infectious between insects. Okay. Okay. And it doesn't happen on, so, so it's, it happens only when the female, the male is the, the only infected one. So if That's you have correct. both the male and the female, as carrying Wolbachia, everything works normally. All of the eggs are, are, that the female produces are, are viable, they can hatch, and they all have Wolbachia inside them. And so it's just when the uninfected female, which you can imagine is the natural mosquitoes in the environment, when she comes across a male mosquito that has Wolbachia and they mate, effectively none of her eggs, she still lays eggs in the environment, but none of those eggs hatch, or very few of them hatch. And so she's all of her downstream production is taken out of the, the um, production going forward. You know, my physician colleagues tell me there are a lot of medicines that work very well, but they don't understand how they work. Uh, some steroids so in particular. And it looks like this is one of those. That's correct. And so we understand the, the effect, but the exact mechanism of how it works, we, we aren't sure of that. Um, many groups that's are working on that currently. That's interesting. A lot of, uh, a few weeks ago, we had a, a call with our colleagues from Imperial College and we discussed the concept of gene drives. Uh, very um, um, uh, active topic now on the malaria sphere, uh, being pursued as one of the potential revolutionary techniques, approaches. A, a big concern with that is the regulatory pathway and uh, possibility of approvals. One of the things that uh, when we were looking, we were preparing for the masterclass, one of the things we realized worked very well for you was this, you know, very early on, you guys received very favorable approval uh, uh, from your local regulators, essentially saying that the mosquitoes with Wolbachia are no more harmful than the natural uh, mosquitoes. And I'm wondering if you could, you know, explain how this process works and what we can borrow from that to support some of the biocontrol initiatives in, in the African continent. Sure. And, and so I think in every country that we've um, undertaken releases, there has been no existing regulatory framework for Wolbachia. It didn't exist. It's not like a conventional insecticide that may have a pathway for regulation. Um, and so that's the first one. It's not a standard um, approach in every country. And so the first country to undertake releases was Australia. And so there was no pathway for that in Australia. There was no agency in Australia that said Wolbachia was within their um, responsibility to regulate. We asked the communities first, um, we undertook extensive community engagement. And the message from the community was they would like independent evaluation of this, you know, experts to evaluate it prior to any releases going ahead. And they would like the government to regulate it before releases are being done. And so this work that you're pointing to here was a risk assessment that was undertaken prior to any releases. And it was done independent of the, the World Mosquito Program or Eliminate Dengue Program by one of Australia's independent uh, premier scientific research organisations. Okay. And so they looked that the potential hazards associated with releasing Wolbachia mosquitoes compared to the existing control methods. And the question they asked is, what's the risk associated with the release of mosquitoes over the next 30 years compared with the standard control methods that are being undertaken? Um, and so the conclusions from that, it's a very thick document and it's publicly available. All of this information is publicly available. 
the overall conclusion there was negligible risk. And so this is the lowest risk rating um, you know, for this type of risk assessment. And so that was available publicly and also to Australian government agencies that ended up taking responsibility for regulating this. Um, but that work took some time to undertake, um, maybe at least one year to, to do this risk assessment. Thank you. Uh, as, as we, I just saw a, 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 a message from Scott Ritchie hey. saying you, you guys have no time Ciao. to um, to assess how CI works. <laughs> that's that's a, that's very interesting. You know, it's like just keep going forward. You know, hey, Scott, it would be nice to hear your voice. If you have a, a, a call. <laughs> I, will mute, uh, I hope I didn't mute Peter. I just I'm muted uh, someone who was in there. I was saying it would be nice to hear uh, Scott Ritchie. It's been a while, so but it's nice to How see the you? comments. That <laughs> very nice, Scott. Uh, it's oh, interesting good. you say it's that you have no time to look at how CI works. Well, I'm not saying that we have no time. I'm just saying. They don't quite know. It's like I thought your analogy with the drug was pretty good. You know, yeah. while while it's working, go ahead, keep using it. But they'll <laughs> sort out the details later. Okay. But it does work. Michael Torelli gave me a, a sticker that I put on my lab, and it said, "I heart CI." <laughs> I want, but I don't know how I want. You know, that's that's just sort of sums it up. You know, if we if we didn't have CI, this thing uh, would have never got off the ground. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, uh, thank you so much. Let's move on to WML. Uh, I think this is probably, you know, you said earlier that this is now the main uh, focus of the Wild Mosquito Program. We, we still have, you know, uh, two or three questions for you before we move to the Anopheles uh, Stephens I work, but uh, WML. So here is a publication you guys released, I believe in 2011. Uh, of course, work yes. started much earlier. And uh, you described for the first time here, a strain that blocks the pathogens, but does not have this survival reduction mechanism. And you, you immediately notice that this is more advantageous than the previous one. Describe this work for us, uh, 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 Peter or Jeremy. That's right. Um, Jeremy, jump in if I miss something. Um, so this work was, um, again, with the WML strain. Um, and so the WML strain we knew in the laboratory did not have this strong fitness effect on the mosquito. So the mosquitoes lived for about the same. The mosquitoes with the WML will back you inside them their lifespan in the insectary was about the same as the wild type mosquitoes that we injected into. Um, the eggs, they produce around the same number of, of eggs per mosquito and the eggs survive for roughly the same amount of time, maybe slightly reduced, maybe a 10% reduction overall with WML. But because of that cytoplasmic incompatibility trait that gave the advantage to females, that would outweigh the fitness cost. And we predicted that it would allow Wolbachia to spread into insect populations. And we then tested, prior to doing any releases, we tested the mosquitoes in the laboratory. So we either fed them on uh, blood that had been spiked with dengue viruses inside them. And then we fed both mosquitoes with Wolbachia mosquitoes without Wolbachia and compared the relative uh, density of dengue inside the mosquitoes. Yeah. So that panel on the right shows this right. very significant drop in dengue replication, both in the WML, but also the WML pop. WML wasn't quite as strong as the WML pop in terms of blocking the pathogen. Um, and then the, the panel on the left there shows we did some large cage experiments prior to going to the field where we could show that we could release small numbers of mosquitoes into an uninfected mosquito population in a large flight cage and show that Wolbachia invaded into that population over several months. So that was all prior to field release, that work. At cellular level, these two strains are the same. Um, morphologically, um, you know, they're microscopic. And so when you visualize them, they, you have to use immunofluorescence to see them. So no different morphologically, you know, genetically they're dis distinct, you know, they're, um, 
it's probably the phenotype is the, the biggest difference. WML pop had very high density, very high concentrations of Wolbachia inside the cells mm. of the insects. And I think it, it, it over replicated and made the insects quite ill or unhealthy. You know, that the, they had a phenomenon called the bendy proboscis where the female yeah, mosquitoes. Yeah, I've seen this. The, the old mosquitoes have a bent proboscis and they can't that's bite. Right. That's right. Um, right. They severely impact, impacted the fitness of the mosquitoes. And we didn't find that out until we undertook the lab studies and some very, we did some early field releases and found that while we could establish well back at a high level, it dropped off over time. So it didn't persist in the insect population. Right. Um, the science is great. The impact is greater, it, assume, it appears. And you guys described a little bit of this before, but then you have, I don't know if this study is published already, but this is your result from your cutter. Talk to us about it. Almost 96% reduction, uh, that's the Australian, almost 77% reduction in dengue cases. I have not yeah. seen any randomized control trial on malaria that gives you this much benefit. No, so these, these results were just announced uh, in December last year, and this was what we were calling a, a gold standard um, randomized controlled trial. And so in the vector control world, I know in malaria, there's many um, randomized controlled trials to evaluate new interventions. But in the 80s and in the dengue world, there's probably a handful of what we call gold standard randomized controlled trials for dengue interventions, the vector ones. And so we were committed to trying to generate evidence of the public health value of, of Wolbachia. So this trial right. was uh, undertaken in the city of Yogyakarta um, in central Java in Indonesia. It's a sort of a middle-sized city for Indonesia, around 400,000 people. Uh, I can um, that. We divided the city up into clusters. And so each cluster was around one kilometer. I'll just check these ones for you. And those clusters then were randomly allocated um, to receive Wolbachia and they released Wolbachia mosquitoes there, or it was the standard vector control insecticide, um, you know, um, thermal fogging in response to dengue in the control clusters. The releases themselves were quite remarkable in that they had to explain to the communities first, first all about what is Wolbachia. And most communities, I don't know what it's like in Africa, but certainly most communities in Asia and Latin America are not used to having mosquitoes released. So this is quite a challenge. And our, our community engagement team there did a great job in being able to explain to the community about Wolbachia and then it needs to release a certain small number of mosquitoes each week for maybe three to six months. And then Wolbachia hopefully would establish and we'd like to measure the impact of this for two years by monitoring communities for dengue. And so all of that work, I think, was testament to the quality of the outreach and engagement that was done there. Um, and so with community approval and approval from the government, they did uh, uh, six to nine months of releases in each of the treatment clusters and then monitored dengue for two years. And so we found that in each of the clusters where Wolbachia had established, it persisted in the local mosquito population above 85, 90% during most weeks as a result of those initial six to eight month releases. And so the intervention was quite stable. And so it can be applied effectively once over a six month period. And then the Wolbachia has passed from generation to generation to mosquito for, for two years, it's been stable. And the monitoring of dengue was people that with suspected uh, fevers would come to roll into clinics and we could test those patients for presence of dengue and other viruses. And we found through all of that, uh, a 77% reduction in virologically confirmed dengue in people that lived in areas where Wolbachia was released compared to people that didn't. And so this was a remarkable result. We were hoping to maybe show a 50% reduction given that these clusters were quite small. Subsequent work has shown that there was no evidence of any clustering of dengue in areas where Wolbachia had uh, been established, which probably indicates that we had imported dengue cases coming into our treatment areas. Overall, okay, no, but this... there, but to, sorry to interrupt you, but, but I, I, do, I would like you to, to have a, a concluding statement on that, but you just mentioned the importation of dengue. And, yes. and before you conclude, I want to bring this study because you also have observational studies from Australia, from from uh, uh, right. from kinds and, and all that. And here you 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 classify imported versus local transmission, uh, and 
I mean, when I first saw this this publication, I think I must have seen 70%, but I read it again and it appears like 96% reduction in dengue. And you see here, there is no local transmission at all. You still have some imported cases, but zero local transmission. Um, That's right. I mean, I, I'm not a salesman for wild mosquito program, but I think any malaria expert seeing this will notice very quickly that we don't have randomized control trial results for any control tool, vector control tool on the malaria side that gives you this much. So this, this work was separate to the, the work, the, the randomized control trial. I think that's the first okay. point. And th this work in, it was in Australia where we have only a small part of the northern part of Australia where dengue occurs. And it's not what we call endemic. It, it's introduced through travelers and, and visitors to Australia that acquire dengue overseas and bring it into those cities. And then we get the secondary cases and what we call here local cases. But that top panel there is correct. It, it shows almost a complete absence of locally acquired dengue cases in areas where Wabaki was established. This has now been for over 10 years in some of the first areas where we released Wolbachia. Um, and so we still have imported cases. Well, prior to COVID crisis happening, we had imported cases and travellers, but it's really decreased because of limited air travel now. And so we still have imported cases of dengue coming into those cities, but we're not seeing the subsequent secondary transmission. So overall, as you said, a 97% reduction during an interrupted time series analysis. So this well, to us is quite promising. To, and I suppose if it could be implemented at a large scale of cities, it could show a very big public health impact. Um, that's our hope and anticipation. So our goal is to not repeat doing randomized controlled trials, but to try and cover large cities and, and uh, demonstrate through the existing public health system, the impact. One of the reasons we think you guys have been so successful is your community engagement um, approaches. And uh, I was lucky once, I went with a group of uh, uh, African Union experts to your Columbia program. And uh, uh, here we met these young people and these old people, the old men and young men and, and girls and school children in the streets with mosquitoes. They are carrying mosquitoes here yeah. and actually, uh, they allowed me even to take one of these cups and open it up in public and nobody threw a stone at me. So <laughs> people just open, release mosquitoes in the streets. How do you reach this stage? Uh, what, I mean, you talk to us about the public engagement approach that has made this so effective that, you know, uh, Fredros from Ifakara could be seen in the streets of Colombia releasing mosquitoes and nobody throws a stone at them. It, uh, it's quite remarkable, I think. And as a, a, a medical entomologist, when I first started on this program, I said, why are we spending all this money on community outreach and engagement? You know, I thought it was, um, uh, it was excessive. Whereas now I think um, it was great that someone else made that call early on. Because I think unless, if you don't get the community outreach and engagement right, it makes it so difficult to implement this. And so the early work I think indicated that um, certainly in Australia and each country we've worked in was not to assume what the questions and uh, concerns communities may have around the approach. And so our first one is to undertake research to understand the community sentiment and issues um, and then try and explain the, um, the methodology on terms that communities can understand. And sometimes the questions they come back with are very legitimate questions that we have to do experiments around and try and answer those. And that was very early on in Australia and Vietnam and so on. As we scaled up, initially we had this consent model where we asked every house in a community whether they support the releases of mosquitoes it quickly became evident that that's not a scalable approach to you know, cover tens of thousands or millions of people. And so we had to adapt to a, what we call a large scale public acceptance model where it still maintains um, the, the authentic engagement with communities, but we put in place um, um, you know, tools and, and things that would engage community sentiment. 
and to make sure we're doing it respectfully to those communities. And so that's been successful. And as you pointed to, Colombia now in the city of Medellin has released across over two or three million people. And you can see here the types of outreach activities that are very community based. And here they've got a play that travels around to schools to explain to school children about it. I think what's quite remarkable about the intervention is it can be actually undertaken by the community members themselves. And you can see community members releasing mosquitoes around their houses. And in fact, we've moved away from releasing adult mosquitoes now to releasing um, mosquito eggs. And so we can give community members uh, small mosquito egg capsules and a small container, and they can assemble that around their house and grow and release their own Wolbachia mosquitoes. It, it's quite a powerful one that shows community participation and uptake. And so the community pull for this has been quite remarkable. Um, communities asking for the intervention to be expanded to their area. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, last question for you uh, before we begin our uh, discussion on Northwest Chief Inside. Uh, lessons for Africa, any plans, uh, also lessons for malaria control community. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, general thoughts on this. Uh, we're very interested in, in working in Africa. And I suppose we're led by experts and led by interest and whether there's um, um, interest of countries. And this intervention, I think, is more applicable to urban areas. Um, you know, Aedes aegypti is principally around people's houses. And so this intervention is most effective where you've got high density of people living together. It's more cost effective to implement across cities. And so most of the we're interested, is there urban settings in Africa that this type of intervention could be relevant? And so there's some scientific questions there around the strain of aegypti. Does Wolbachia block effectively in, in African aegypti that are transmitting dengue? I suppose there's some fundamental questions there. I suppose the key one is there a priority. Is there a sufficient burden of dengue in the big cities to, to warrant doing this? And we're interested to hear from experts and people from different countries whether this could be a viable option, a cost-effective tool. Peter, Jeremy, thank you. This is wonderful. And uh, uh, many, many experts are on this line. Uh, we spoke to Basel uh, Kamgang earlier, uh, many people working on AIDS, many people working on malaria. Uh, if you don't mind, we will ask you to post your email on the chat just for people to reach out to you. Uh, you can also uh, visit the Wild Mosquito Program website. And I hope you guys don't mind that our colleagues are reaching out to you to ask additional questions. Uh, I must say congratulations to you and the program. Uh, pass our regards to Scott O'Neill uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, Scott Ritchie. Uh, and I hope you're staying longer with us to listen to the conversation that Sheila and myself are going to be hosting right now on the Northwest list yeah. side. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fred Ross. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, Sheila, let's let's proceed. But before we, we start, Sheila, do you have any anything you want to tell Peter and the other guys? Um, yeah, thanks, Fred. Um, at the moment, um, no. I think we can move in move on to the Anopheles Stephens I section. Right. Thank you so much. And and on this section, we are very lucky that we have with us. Uh, um, an expert from the World Health Organization. We also have a, a great young but very active scientist, uh, uh, Fitzum Tudese. I have to say, Fitzum, you, you must allow me, but Fitzum finished his PhD with 12 publications. I've never seen any of them. Uh, and he already had an active laboratory. So congratulations <laughs> to begin that. Uh, Michelle and myself are going to be hosting this discussion now uh, for the next hour, and I, I hope uh, uh, that we, we, we can continue to con contribute as, much, as actively as, as, as we have had that. To begin with, um, we are at crossroads, if you, if you like, um, or maybe not. Um, uh, according to the last World Malaria Report, we have been seen multiple, we have been shown multiple times these reductions that were expected, the green line but then we have the blue line. Now, very unfortunately, at the same time in 2019, WHO puts out vector a lot, an awfully stiff inside in Africa. 
a question to you, uh, uh, Fitzum. Uh, should we be scared? Uh, thank you, Fredros, for the opportunity to join this uh, interesting discussion. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, we should be worried about the introduction and the spread of Anopheles Stephensi in the Horn of Africa. Uh, it was first reported from Djibouti in 2012 and later in eastern part of Ethiopia, uh, bordering uh, Djibouti in 2016. And like in subsequent years, it was reported in Sudan, Somalia, and in more settings within Ethiopia. And the vector has a unique uh, ecology. It mainly prefers to breed in urban settings where the malaria control programs are not typically giving uh, emphasis. Malaria is mainly thought of as a rural disease in Africa. So when you don't have the intervention ready uh, to put any effort in such settings, the introduction of a highly efficient malaria transmitting vector into this continent, which is already highly hit by malaria burden, is something that really worries me. Thank you. We have with us on the on the call today, uh, uh, Dr. Ayman, and we also have Sarah. Uh, I'm going to request Sarah and Ayman to answer the same question. Also, because we have, you know, previously been told that maybe it's a problem. Maybe we shouldn't worry a lot. Maybe we should worry. Sarah and Ayman, should we worry? Short question. Okay, uh, I guess we'll go first. Um, yeah. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to, to engage in this um, very interesting and very helpful masterclass that you are uh, arranging in the, the car. Um, regarding emphasis to in, in Horn of Africa, it's really worrisome. And uh, that, in, in a nutshell, uh, because what um, my colleague uh, Fisson have said, the program in Africa um, is under huge burdens of fighting against uh, the efficient, um, locally uh, prevalent efficient vectors. However, those vectors are mainly uh, on this Gambia, uh, which is, has a totally different um, breeding site and uh, feeding and resting behavior. However, all, all the um, level rams are trained and to do their routine work according to the knowledge they have accumulated over years. With the emergence of anophilus stephens I, it's bring a huge threat uh, for malaria and uh, malaria epidemic in urban settings. Uh, because of its nature uh, and tendency to uh, mainly breed in man-made water uh, containers. And that in, in one aspect, we will move from having a relatively short um, malaria transmission season during the rainy season, we will move toward a year-long transmission seasons because in most of African settings or urban settings, there is no sustainable water supply, so people tend to store water in their uh, containers, and these water containers will provide the suitable uh, breeding environment for anophthalmic stephen sign. So it will be throughout the year, and you can imagine how threatening that will be. Additionally, most of the uh, African populations is uh, um, densely, densely populated in urban area, so a um, higher proportion of the populations will be in area of high risk of malaria. So unless um, an immediate and urgent um, action have been deployed by all the concerned countries and uh, keep an vigilant eye on, on the distribution of these vectors and um, proper vector control uh, tools, interventions, and collaboration at international and national levels, in, in these regions, we are facing a dire situation and hopefully we, we will coordinate in a better way. And one step to avoid this, uh, it was the release of this alert from the WHO to bring all uh, concerned people all together and think how, how we can go forward with this. Thank you. Thank we, you. We can, 
Yeah, so Sarah, actually, instead of you addressing that question, uh, take this up from us uh, 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 instead. First report, Djibouti, 2012, this is data collection. I hope Sarah is still with us. Uh, and and um, the alert comes in 2019. Uh, this is the first report of uh, Nofles Stephensai. Um, uh, in Africa, I believe. Uh, Ayman, you can correct us if, if, if uh, Shell and myself got it wrong. But hope, uh, we believe this is the first report. Uh, yes. this, this data is collected in 2012. The alert that we have from WHO is in 2019. This is a seven year period. And I guess the question we have for Sarah here and, 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 and maybe Ayman, you can add, was this a question of us not sure whether it's a problem yet, or why did we take too long to have this alert in place? Yeah, thank you uh, for the opportunity. And I see there are lots of experts on the line as well. Um, you know, I, th I think that's a very interesting question. And it, at, at the time it was first just detected in Djibouti and there wasn't yet confirmation um, from other locations. It wasn't until um, 2016 that it was detected in, in Ethiopia. I worked at Tamar Carter, um, was did along with many other, uh, really many other um, Ethiopian colleagues. And I think perhaps, you know, there was a, a question of whether this was a localized problem or not. Um, as you've seen in recent years, the, the cases in Djibouti of malaria have gone up you know, substantially. And, and uh, I think with the alert kind of came, came uh, notice to increase surveillance in, in locations around Djibouti and to really begin looking for it. I think without, uh, without truly looking for Anopheles Stevens, it may be easy to um, misidentify it as Anopheles Gambi or, or otherwise. Um, and I think the alert was just just that it, it did it it did the job of alerting the community to begin looking for it some more. But that, that is a very uh, good question. I think with most invasive species, the first detection <laughs> um, there's always a question mark of whether this, it's a localized uh, localized introduction or if there is further population establishment and expansion. So perhaps that's the reason. Yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Sheila, please. Yeah, thanks, Fred Ross. Um, yeah, so to Ayman, um, looking at the, the aquatic behavior of Aedes mosquitoes and that of Anopheles stephensi, it looks like there are some similarities. Um, so in terms of looking at the control and surveillance of Anopheles stephensi, what are some of the lessons that we can learn from the Aedes side of things, as well as the other um, anopheles vectors. How can we, what are some of the lessons that we can learn when we are looking into controlling and um, conducting surveillance for, for Stephen Sai? Uh, okay, um, that's a very interesting question. Um, but if you allow me, I would, would like to go just a little bit um, back, backward to, to add what uh, my colleague, um, Sa uh, steam colleague Sarah have, have mentioned about um, 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 in response to Petro's uh, uh, question about the delay in, in releasing the alert. And um, to release such a global alert, you need to have at least some baseline data. And, um, and um, uh, with the first report from Djibouti and um, second uh, from SUB in 2016, and in, from Sudan in 2000, uh, early 2019, uh, WHO have convenient uh, a technical consultancy. And uh, this alert was, uh, was uh, the first product of, of that um, uh, consultancy meetings. Uh, and uh, the main purpose of um, that consultancy was to us to bring experts, not um, uh, from Africa only, but also from Asia, where this vector is um, endemic there, and there is substantial knowledge uh, about the vector and its control. And this brings me uh, to, to, to your questions about uh, what's um, the best uh, control strategy and what we, we, could, we could do. 
we still lack in in uh, hugely in information about about this vector behavior in, in in the African setting. However, it's um, at least at the breeding level, it's um, I would say um, mostly in man-made water container uh, because a few reports have shown that it can also breed on ground. Have been shown to breed on ground in Africa. However. Uh, uh, it's mainly in uh, marmalade container, including uh, open tanks and cement tanks and uh, uh, other water storage uh, containers. And I guess this is um, bring both challenge and opportunities. Uh, the challenge is, is that with uh, the discarded and unused uh, potential water containers, we will have a numerous uh, amount of potential breeding sites. Uh, that cannot easily be covered by malaria uh, control programs. Uh, the opposite side of that is if we could engage the community, uh, we could uh, give huge breakthrough in this because most of this container is in, in house or uh, around house. So it's in a way or another is accessible and uh, eliminatable or could be totally removed from, from, from those areas. So, um, Larva source management, it is, it is the main key and uh, the first recommendation for the show for, for the control of anthracite and dye. And with the engagement with the community, it's, it's doable and it could, could uh, get uh, uh, the success of your party. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks, Ayman. So there's a question in the chat box and I think it's quite relevant. So I think before we even think about controlling um, and controlling Stephen Sai and looking at its surveillance, do we know what the breeding sites look like? Does it have typical breeding sites or does it have the um, behavioral ad adaptation to specific breeding sites? It has been, uh, most of the records so far have shown that it's a co um, uh, the breeding site that simply uh, used or uh, infested by Aedes aegypti, uh, which is um, uh, include barrel and uh, um, cementic tank and septic tank and uh, unused uh, water container. So anything that, and also um, um, air conditioners, water-based air conditioner and stuff like that. So basically, every mammoth container uh, that can hold the water for lives, it could be a potential breeding site uh, so far. And all this uh, reminds us that we, with, with the ongoing uh, uh, vector control uh, uh, oriented uh, uh, against Aedes aegypti, this is offered additional opportunity for, for the integration uh, or the integrated vector management using the same resources available or uh, better control of ADC Yeah, thank you. Back to you, Fred. Uh, uh, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, I would like to bring in uh, Sarah and Fitzum um, uh, back onto this question. So here is an incredibly you know, uh, detailed analysis um, conducted by our colleagues from Imperial College, uh, Marian Sinka and, and crew. I, I, I guess maybe one of, or two of them are on the call today. Describing the potential, um, um, the, essentially identifying cities that have the greatest risk um, with regard to this, this threat. I would like to have, you know, your opinion as experts, you know, yourself, uh, Fitzum and Sarah, uh, general opinion or kind, some kind of, you know, um, what, what should we say, a, you know, a, a brief analysis of this work uh, and how we should interpret it. Um, if we are in the Indian Ocean coast, for example, uh, what should we take from this work for implementation? So we can start with you, Sarah, and then fit them. Yeah, I, you know, I think one thing that's quite striking about this study in particular is the, uh, the predicted number of people that could be affected if Xenophilic Stevens I begins to, to spread further across the continent. And um, one really key takeaway from this is that, you know, urban areas, again, as Fitzem mentioned previously, you know, urban areas become uh, 
higher risk than rural areas where most malaria vector control efforts tend to be focused now. And so really keeping in mind this potential shift in, in um, focal locations is, is likely to be essential. And, and I think you know, this work does a great job highlighting maybe locations to begin surveillance in urban areas across the continent and has a really wonderful map with detailed sites where where maybe this could begin um, to see how far the species has has expanded its range uh, fits in yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that was an interesting point uh, uh, Ferreros. So uh, one of the important lessons we learned from uh, the studies that have been uh, undertaken recently in this uh, prediction is that the introduction of anaphylaxis stephens into the Horn of Africa uh, seems like it's following uh, the trade route and the transportation routes from uh, the ports to the central part of uh, the countries which are already affected, even if we don't have like a concrete data to, to prove this. I know that Sarah and the team in SETA are working with uh, many data, including like uh, ship data and other transportation routes, including uh, livestock. And also the genetic analysis we, we have done and also the previous study by Tamar's group also ha highlighted that uh, the mosquitoes we detect in Ethiopia are highly related with the ones in uh, Djibouti and also like further up uh, in, in Pakistan. And yeah. then, uh, uh, after his first detection in 2016 in eastern part of Ethiopia, which is uh, closer to Somalia and also uh, closer to Djibouti, uh, further study by the PMI vector link group in Ethiopia in 2018 and then the uh, succeeding years indicated that the vector has really spread into uh, the central part of the country. But when they have done sampling in the western part, they, they, they couldn't de detect it uh, further from uh, the main transportation routes. Routes, but, yeah. yeah one of the things maybe we, need, we really need to be cautious about is, uh, of course, Anifla Stephens are mainly breeds in urban settings, but it's not only an urban vector. It could be also a rural vector as far as you have like the suitable uh, containers, the aquatic habitat. So it mainly prefers to breed in human-made water storage containers. So as far as you have those containers in rural settings, you, you, can, you can find Hello, can you still hear Fitzum? Hey, Shayla, can you hear Fitzum? No, I, I can't hear him either. I think we lost uh, uh, Fitzum a little bit. Oh, I mean, a quick follow-up question there to, uh, uh, to uh, Sarah. If you look at that map, you wonder why we haven't found the mosquitoes in Mombasa, for example. Is this a case of people not looking? Or Dar es Salaam? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question. And it looks like that's been brought up in the, the chat as well. Is it a case of, um, you know, may, maybe uh, not detecting it or, or no reports from those locations? could mean that it's not there, which would be great. Um, it could be a case where it, it may be potentially misidentified or the, the there is no surveillance for it um, in the urban areas in the larval habitats where it's typically found. I think, you know, as has been mentioned, these um, a lot of these larval habitats where it's found are in water storage containers or abandoned construction uh, sites and places where there typically isn't much malaria sur vector surveillance work done. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it would be very interesting to learn more about the surveillance efforts in those locations if they are ongoing and this is a true absence um, or, or if, uh, you know, the efforts are just focused elsewhere. Right. And I hope that uh, Fitzum will be able to join join us back um, uh, soon. I think he has a little problem with that. Uh, Sheila, back to you. I think I'm back. You have a question yeah, sorry, about... there was a problem oh. cutting. The usual problem. Sorry, <laughs> sorry Fitzum. Did you want to uh, continue or? Yeah, I, I think I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Back to you, Sheila. Measuring uh, risk. Yeah, thank you, Fred Ross. So, um, Sarah, how do we measure the risk? Um, what should we be doing then? Should we actively search for it? How should we approach this? 
That's a really good question. And I think there are many experts on the line from uh, PMI Vectorlink and other countries who I think would also have, uh, have really good suggestions here. Um, I, I think as, as Fitzam mentioned in, in a lot of the locations in Ethiopia where it's been detected, it has been sort of along uh, transportation routes, but also um, now found a little bit further outside of, of key urban areas and transportation routes. But um, I think, you know, in, in, I guess, high impact transport hubs, maybe a, a good place to look, as we see with actually, you know, the invasive uh, 80s mosquitoes as well, those transportation hubs tend to be pretty good highways for the genetic flow and population movement. So um, I think that would be interesting. Looking at connectivity between locations that uh, where it has not yet been detected and locations where we know it now has established um, may help to identify specific sites um, where surveillance could be conducted. And I, I think really one, one thing that everyone has, has emphasized is being aware and, and the alert, being aware of the situation where we have these unique malaria vectors in habitats that are so unlike the other habitats where we see, we see other malaria vectors, um, I think is a, a good first step. And if there are efforts uh, or possibilities to combine with 80s surveillance, you know, that, yeah. that may be an, an, um, a good integrative way moving forward to um, do surveillance for both mosquitoes. Um, in Ethiopia, there's been some evidence um, from the work led by Mishesha uh, showing that there is co-occupancy of Aedes and Anopheles Stevens eye in some, some man-made containers. So that may be helpful as well. Yeah, that's really interesting um, because you find that in most of the African um, urban cities, we don't really report a lot of malaria cases or any malaria cases so I'm wondering then if we are not reporting any malaria cases, that means we are not conducting any vector surveillance. Um, so should we then be looking at the case management side of things? Once we report cases, then that's when we go out to look for the vectors. I mean, it's a bit confusing how then we would do it in the as where no vector surveillance or malaria control is happening. Um, maybe Ayman or Fitzam, you'd help comment on that one. I will, I will leave that, uh, I guess, for Fitzam. Uh, uh, he Shira, does can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, I had a, an, an internet issue. No, it's just a matter of you commenting on how we should approach it, um, because we don't observe or report a lot of malaria cases in the urban areas. So that means that in terms of vector surveillance for malaria control, we don't really invest in vector surveillance in urban areas. So then if we are not investing in vector surveillance, how then we will, will we know that there is um, an offless Stephensi? Should we then be working with the case management side of things to first of all detect malaria cases in the urban areas? Okay, uh, if I have to set a priority in uh, doing surveillance and control or elimination efforts regarding this newly introduced uh, mosquito, I would rather uh, uh, invest more on uh, working in, in the side of the mosquito than on the case management, because we, we are saying that this is just a recent introduction and then it's, uh, uh, it's not yet uh, widely distributed, but, but we still need evidence. And then uh, for instance, in our case in Ethiopia, we, we are working on a strategic plan, a national strategic plan, uh, aiming for elimination of the vector in five years. So it's very ambitious. Uh, so I would, I would rather go for uh, uh, working on the side of the, the mosquito, but if you if we have to wait until the case build up due to the introduction of the Anopheles stephens, maybe it's already too late to have an effort to eliminate the mosquito. For instance, if you go into uh, data to the WHO report from the WHO and look at the uh, case data from Djibouti, like in 2013, a year after the detection of Anopheles stephens. In Djibouti city, there were only 1,600 cases a year in Djibouti city. 
But in 2019, there is already 49,000 cases reported from Djibouti city, which is like several falls than uh, uh, six years ago. Uh, th there are no studies that associated the introduction of anaphylaxis to Stephen Tsai uh, with the buildup of the case, but there are indications that there is epidemiological link between uh, the, the expansion of the vector and the case. So once it is already too late, to quantify the effect of the vector with case management and uh, counting the case, maybe we are too late to uh, to do uh, anything in controlling or eliminating the vector. So I would focus more on uh, the vector side. Yeah, Fitzum, it's interesting yeah. that you, 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 go ahead, Sheila. Yeah, thanks, Fred. I was just going to um, include the question that we have in the chat box. Um, and it's related to what you've mentioned, Fitzum. Um, what then should we be doing to eliminate the vector in the Horn of Africa? Okay, so uh, so as we already have started the discussion, the problem is not focalized. It's not a problem for Ethiopia, it's not a problem for Djibouti only. So we really need to have an integrated and cross-border collaboration and open sharing and also uh, like a, 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 an action which is spearheaded by regional uh, agents or like research institutes such as like the IFACARA, like coordinating regional activities, like the introduction of uh, anaphylaxis defense in Ethiopia may be like the result of like a porous border like we have and also all the goods that we have to import via Djibouti port. But there is also the other way around uh, effect from Ethiopia. For instance, Djibouti was reporting on uh, mainly plasmodium falciparum case like for the last couple of decades. But recently, it's just mainly dominated by plasmodium vivax, which is not common in Africa. So if you also go to Sudan, for instance, maybe Ayman can comment on this later on. Uh, Sudan is also witnessing like a large buildup of plasmodium vivax case. Maybe there is like the vector is coming from the Djibouti side to Ethiopia and the parasites are going to the Djibouti side from Ethiopia. So there is a flow of parasites and vectors across all the borders. The, border, the borders are very porous, you know. So we really need to have cross-border collaboration in order to deal with this problem. So the strategic plan we are working on in Ethiopia and the one uh, Sudan is also forging ahead, is not like going to help unless we have a regional collaboration. I am loving the, the masterclass today. I don't know about you, Shayla, but I think the, the suggestions are just incredible. And Fitzum, it's, it's nice that you guys, and Eman, I would like to hear your comments on this as well. It's nice that you guys are singling out this invasive vector for vector elimination. And, and instead of focusing on you know, malaria elimination, but really just saying, let us get the vector out. Uh, Eman, it would be nice to hear your comment on this, and then we have a question specific for you as well right now. Very um, that. Um, firstly, uh, let me highlight that um, although it, uh, an African system is a huge threat to Africa, but not Africa alone, it has been also emerged in Sri Lanka in 2017. And uh, considering that Sri Lanka have been uh, certified by the WHO malaria in 2016, that uh, was a huge threat uh, uh, to malaria reintroduction in Sri Lanka, in, but in, in the urban area. And um, uh, with, with the African context and, uh, and uh, introduction of or high buildup in malaria vivax in, instead of uh, falciparum that we used to have in, in Africa that bring additional challenge not only uh, on the vector control bar but also in the case management, drug and drug resistance and, and several other issues uh, with the limited resources uh, we have, it, uh, have in, in Africa. Um, therefore, um, as, as uh, Fistum have mentioned, um, we need to uh, increase our uh, global coordinations and collaborations. And uh, is that um, have been considered by the WHO since last year, but in, in, specifically in November, when we have start, uh, started um, our global coordinated uh, uh, meeting, uh, which is uh, held uh, frequently, uh, um, uh, like every three uh, months, quarterly. Uh, to bring uh, not only uh, people working in the surveillance and response and control of anaphylaxis in Africa and infected country, but also to bring uh, global experts and leader, uh, leading scientists uh, who work on, in this area and uh, uh, another stakeholder from uh, other agencies uh, who support uh, such activity and people also from Asia with, who have uh, 
uh, an accumulated experience in dealing with an office is different design. And this one step to bring all the concerned people together in, in tackling this one issue. And blade elimination, it is the main uh, goal uh, and, and uh, the target for the global malaria strategy. However, um, an office of design, it can risk all the success we have done so far and all people done together in, in reducing malaria burden globally in Africa particularly. So it needs to be targeted as a standalone emerging issue. Um, and on the same time, we invest in, in our um, progress, uh, continuing, continuing our progress in toward malaria elimination. So all that go together, hopefully we will make it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ayman. Uh, we, just for the sake of time, I'm going to push us a little further. Um, and I would like us to talk a little bit more about the vector uh, here. Uh, one thing that will also come back later is uh, um, on the, the, the survival in the dry season. Uh, Fixum was mentioning the adaptability in rural areas. Uh, some of the evidence, the report, the, the document from WHO seems to suggest that some of many of these mosquitoes are already pyrethroid resistant. Uh, Eamon, from the WHO side, uh, from the work that you're doing, the coordination in the uh, Horn of Africa, what are the unique features that we need to watch out for from the entomology side that make this distinct? you know, uh, um, relative to the other vectors we are used to? Um, uh, regarding our system, as I, um, that uh, make it need our utmost attention is, uh, in addition to the lack of information, as I mentioned, in, in, in Africa, we know, up to now, we don't know when it has been first introduced in, in Africa. Uh, it has been, uh, yes, uh, first in Djibouti, that, but that might be not the first introductions. And, uh, and also the root of, of introductions, that's uh, I mean, an, an important issue that we, we, need, we need to know, not only historically, but also to prevent uh, future introduction in, in case we, we hopefully uh, succeeded in the eliminations and also to prevent it from entering into new, new uh, other areas. Uh, other issue um, that we have about, with, about an office system that is up to now we don't know the extent of its distribution in, in Africa entirely and also in the country has where it has been already reported because when um, the report doesn't show it that doesn't mean it doesn't mean an office system size is not there uh, mainly because um, malaria control programs uh, surveillance systems um, um, it's, uh, it's, high, it's under huge burdens um, throughout the year. So they tend to, to do uh, less morphological confirmations and uh, molecular uh, confirmation for the vectors. So um, when, uh, whenever they have like this area only known by, uh, to be invested by anopheles arabensis. So whenever they find anopheles there, it's assumedly it's anopheles arabensis. And I guess most of the report uh, about detecting an office a sequence sign in Africa were uh, a result of serendipity and research. So like it's yeah. been detected accidentally. Right. And yeah. that, that's, that's limit our ability to determine why uh, we need to invest, invest more. So surveillance system is our, our core strategy. We need to first know the extent of, of the threat we have. And also uh, additional threat, it's, um, it's co-feed on human and, and, and other animals. It's not exclusive uh, feeder on human. So even when there is no human around, so it still can sustain uh, uh, in that environment by feeding on other animals. And that bring additional issues. So it can yeah. uh, adapt to the situation. Thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, I we have already, this is a document from your office, Eamon, um, WHO, on what countries should do. I just want to uh, highlight it to our colleagues on the call. Uh, it's available on WHO website, some of the things that you can already do. I believe it will be updated soon. Uh, Fitzum would like to invite uh, Dr. Meshesha as well to, to make some comment. Fitzum, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Dr. Meshesha, maybe you can comment on the earlier question about uh, the unique features of Anopheles stephensi that makes it uh, difficult or unique to control in our settings. 
Thank you so much um, for inviting me. Um, the unique features are one, it breeds in um, artificial breeding habitats in urban areas where scarcity of water is, um, is, is, is there and uh, it exploits that opportunity where people you know, store water in containers. And the other thing is it feed you know, from the blood analysis, what we have seen is that only a small number of mosquitoes feed on humans. And yet the infection rates of PV and PF is very high. And for some uh, laboratory study, it is more uh, susceptible than the Anopheles arabensis. And the other one is the surveillance. The adults, the, um, co the conventional methods which we use for adult collections like human land collection, CDC light traps, uh, pyrotrum spray collections, all these are, are useless when it comes to, I mean, less efficient when it comes to um, surveillance of anaphylis deficiency. So we, you know, really, you know, uh, larva surveillance is more important, particularly when yeah. uh, you are doing surveillance in a new area. Um, that's, I have over. Before you leave, can you just make a quick comment also on, on this subject here? Uh, Professor Maureen Kotze has recently updated the keys to an off lanes. Uh, in Africa. And in the new keys, one of the major additions there is an awfully stiff inside. Uh, we see here very quickly, it's, you know, both of both Gambi and Stephens I have speckled legs, but then, you know, the, this dark area and the, the, the white, this, the, the white space in the third dark area, there is yeah. two of them in Stephens I in, and there's only one in an office Gambi. It's a comment on this and just to help our uh, vector control experts on the easiest way to distinguish between these two species. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we recently we uh, gave training on a, on a, a morphological identification of NFLS to 46 staff of universities, uh, those working in the um, public health, uh, including the Ministry of uh, Health. And this, the picture you see, we use the picture and it is, it is not difficult, you know, it is not difficult to identify anaphylis stephensi, but just to looking, in fact, you know, the, uh, looking at the speckles on the lake, the anaphylis stephensi is wider than anaphylis, uh, anaphylis uh, uh, gambe. And these are very simple, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, but the, the thing is that sometimes, you know, this, the second, uh, uh, the spot on the second, you know, fuses with the white, with the long white um, band. And that may be a little bit difficult, you know, for some people, but otherwise just one, the pulp and uh, the spots on the third, on the third, that's the one which is uh, for oh, Anaphilis Arabensis. And there is no uh, that spot on Anaphilis Stephensi. That is enough, you know, to identify, to distinguish So in the Stephensi, you don't have the spot. If you, if you look yes, at where I'm pointing, correct. the Stephensi, you don't have the spot on the third dark area here. No, uh, no spot, but in Anaphilis. On the second Gambi area, you have spot. two spots here. Correct. Okay. And in you know Gambi, the, you the, have the two one spots, and Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. And then, you no. know, looking at the uh, parts, you know, there are speckles. You know, the, the part is speckled in Anopheles stephensi and not in Anopheles gambe. They have okay. speckles, you know. <laughs> on the, yeah, on the, I, mean, I mean, we, we use uh, this image a lot on, uh, on our master classes. Yeah. And people usually don't realize it's Anopheles stephensi. I mean, I, it's, we, we don't have this in our lab, but um it's a great photograph uh, joachim my friend from 50 ph gave it to us yeah uh, if you are interested uh, we may send you some we you may send, send you some, some specimens you know thank you dry specimens
Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Shela, did you have any question on that before I proceed? Uh, no, Fred, we can move on. Okay. So uh, to you, uh, Sarah, um, in 2000 and when was this? I have to figure this out, 2019. Uh, Professor Tarkin and Lindsay published this paper where they described the increased threat of this. And they, they kind of elevated this big time. They, they, they were, it was almost like, you know, let's call an emergency of some sort or so, with good justification. I think. But one thing they also mentioned in the paper is that we, may, we should consider Anopheles Stephens as an opportunity. So at the end of their paper, they refer us to the global vector control response. And then they say the inversion of Anopheles Stephens mosquitoes on African continent is a threat to the health, but it also provides an opportunity to build vector control strategies. The question we have for you, uh, uh, Sarah, and then to the others as well, is how do we take advantage of the existing GVCR framework or any other mechanism to deal with the Nofless method in a serious way? With the Nofless Stephens I mean. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, and I think as, as Fitzem mentioned earlier too, this is a, an opportunity for really widespread coordination and collaboration um, and really integrating vector control strategies at, at, at kind of a larger scale and, and understanding um, how, you know, as, as we learned in the first part of the, the masterclass, a lot of the strategies that are used for 80s surveillance, like the, the larval surveillance techniques, you know, can also be applied for um, to Anopheles. Stevens Islands are really great opportunity to, uh, again, as Fitzsim mentioned, to have sort of regional collaboration, coordination, and, and communication about this issue and about vector control tools that may work and in integrated vector control. Um, approaches. So I think it really, it's a, it's, you know, <laughs> it is a, a dire situation and it requires urgent ac action, but there really does seem to be, as is as shown even on this call, this opportunity um, to establish kind of widespread communication efforts um, and really integrate what's known. So, yeah. Thanks. Eamon, let's hear from you a little bit here from the WHO side. I think many of, 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 of the people here from the countries would like to go, um, you follow the guidelines from WHO, but also to provide support to the WHO initiatives. In practical terms, can you talk to us about the how? How do we eradicate Anopheles Stephenson from uh, Africa? Honestly, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a challenging goal, uh, to be honest. It's not, it's not uh, that- answer. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just put up the, the image here for the GVCR, uh, just, just for the sake of it. Yeah, but go ahead, please. Yeah, so um, I was saying it's, it's a challenging goal. Um, however, uh, the first steps um, uh, to achieve this goal, uh, um, to eliminate the Stevens like from from Horn of Africa, uh, assuming that it's not uh, has not uh, spread any further yet, is uh, the surveillance systems. We hugely and um, um, intensively lack information about the, the, the to what extent these vectors have have uh, spread into uh, Horn of Africa. Um, immediately with that go deploying uh, the effective vector control uh, strategy. Uh, and uh, that is feared by or led by mainly uh, um, uh, the vector control programs in coordination with all uh, implementation and partners and, and support from uh, local and international funders. And one of the most uh, effective tools so far, and that's the one is the, the, the LSM. Uh, lava source management, uh, whether uh, destroyment, removal, or uh, treating with uh, WHO approved uh, or recommended uh, uh, insecticide or uh, chemical. Um, however, that's uh, required um, uh, in, in implementing um, other aspects of the GFCR is uh, multi sectorial collaborations and community engagement, and uh, those two aspects cannot be um, excluded from uh, any 
uh, plan if it uh, um, if due to succeed in, in eliminating of uh, of his uh, Stephen Um Also, um, um, getting um, uh, the sense of of risk or sensitizing the community and our yeah. politicians about about uh, um, policy maker about how serious this this threat. Uh, it will help not only mobilizing the resources, but also in, um, um, in making this multi-sectorial and multi-ministry uh, collaborations work because military programs uh, on their own cannot, cannot um, achieve this with, with the burdens uh, they had at the moment with high increase in malaria, forgetting about the other um, challenge that uh, COVID-19 have uh, brought in. Yeah. And um, uh, COVID-19 had uh, additional um, challenge for anophysis in in particular, because anophysis in surveillance and control require respecting um, breathing site in house and out, indoor and outdoors, and that might increase uh, human contact, and therefore additional precautions need to be put in, in, in place. Uh, also, use of uh, other protections uh, methods, including IRS and um, L Alliance, um, uh, where uh, they are not already used. It's uh, recommended by the WHO um, to, to reduce um, um, the epidemiological impact of uh, anopheles, uh, Stephen sign, and reduce um, and contributing to reducing its, its populations as well. Okay. And um, the, the major key um, and the the best opportunity we have here it is the uh, integrations with with uh, uh, the previously well discussed issue of arboviruses. So um, the main vector of arbovirus is have been proven to be cohabit um the similar cohabit and cohabit in um, this man with water container in with the uh, Eris Egypti. And if we if we um, integrate the control for both, that will be two bears with one stone, and uh, maximize our our uh, benefit. No, uh, uh, Sheila, uh, wanna um, ask any additional questions here? No, Fred. Let's move on. All right. Thank you so much, um, Ayman. Um, some many, many things for us to learn going forward, but at the same time, things that we can already apply. I have a question here to uh, to Eman and Sarah, uh, and, and it would be nice to hear from you, Fitzum, if you have any additional comments as well. This is a different report from Djibouti. This is published five, yes, please. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Like Fred, we couldn't. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. No, hear yeah, we're here. So we can hear. Uh, you. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Sheila, there's a there's a message for you, personal message in the chat. Uh, this is a report five years after the Djibouti original description, and. In this, it describes, you know, basically confirming that this is now established. But one thing that it shows, there's a graph in that paper that if you look at this graph, let me just see if I can highlight it uh, for Sarah and, uh, and, and uh, Eamon. If you look at this graph here, graph number A, it's uh, pulled out of that paper. The figure with the boxes, that's 2013. So that's what you see here. In 2013, they not only had fewer uh, of these mosquitoes, but you know, that's what you have. And then in the 2017, this is the dry season. You see a bump there in the dry season. I don't know if I'm understanding this properly, but the point here is that this appears to be a mosquito that survives very well, even in the hot climate. And I think uh, you were mentioning earlier, Eman, that it might mean that malaria becomes a problem of the entire season, the entire year, even in places where it was seasonal. Talk to us a little bit about this and, and why this will complicate uh, the malaria control situation. Um, here. I, don't, I don't know if I picked this up 
uh, correctly, but I, I guess that's the, the point there that you, you lose the seasonality that you would otherwise have in an urban environment such as the city of Djibouti. Uh, and, and now with Stephen's eye, you start to have uh, malaria the whole time. Uh, Sarah, would like to go first or? Oh, no? sure, sure. And I, I can turn it back over to you shortly <laughs> after. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, and Fitzam and Mishesha probably have some more insight on this as well. I think, you know, there does seem to be evidence that be, perhaps due to the container breeding uh, lifestyle of, of this mosquito seems to be able to thrive in, in drier periods than what we traditionally see with uh, with other malaria vectors. And, I, you know, perhaps that is due to use, the use of man-made containers, but it seems to persist um, in the Ethiopia data throughout the dry periods. Um, and so now I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Ayman. Yeah, Thanks, uh, yeah um, I, I totally agree with that. And I, I guess the main risk is, is, um, is the ability of, of anaphylaxis to, to adapt and spread uh, quickly. And um, this, um, this is supported by by the fact that it's spread in man-made work containers that uh, put it in uh, a micro environment uh, where it can avoid uh, the harsh weather situations and, and hot uh, uh, times. Also, it is uh, ability, um, it's preference to feed on animals. Thus, um, an animals usually people try to to make them um, to the animal in more comfortable area and provide uh, like shelter and stuff and stuff like that. So in animal shelter, they will find um, an opportunity to avoid the hard situations and uh, the heat, uh, find water to breathe and source for blood meal. So it's an ideal situation for such urban vectors. And also the urban sitting in Africa, I guess it's supporting that by, by many ways, it is by its reliance on uh, storing water and which is um, creating some like um, colder and um, more humid and um, more suitable in micro environment in human dwellings and in, in houses. That's, that's provides the ideal situation for an office like that. And I guess with, with the other thing that about all our vector control or most of our vector control in Africa is mainly deployed in rural cities and um, the, uh, the still ongoing lack of sense about threat of malaria in urban cities that leave an office team eye away from uh, the probable vector control that might help in limiting their distributions and stuff so far. So again, we, I can't emphasize more on, on the need for, for surveillance and uh, to deploy the probable vector control to tailor for an office team that's like immediately where it is have been detected and also enforcing the international health regulations that 2017 to prevent further spread from where it has been uh, reported already and um, to help us to contain the vector where it has been already reported and we will collaborate on, 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 on its elimination. So, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Shayla. Uh, Yeah, thank you, Fredros. Um, so, um, Fitzam, uh, how can we then um, leverage, or how can then we leverage the multisectoral approaches that are outlined in the global vector control response for the control of Anopheles Stephensi? Thank you, Sheila, for the question. So an important step in this regard is uh, appreciating uh, the burden and uh, the, the challenge that's just uh, coming up with the introduction of this vector. And as it was highlighted earlier, uh, multi-sectoral and cross-border collaboration is, is important to deal with this vector. So an important observation, maybe if I have not described it earlier, is that Whenever we go to uh, inspect uh, water storage containers in cities and towns across the transportation route, we 
we have found like at least 40% of the water storage containers had both uh, Aedes mosquitoes and Anopheles stephansi uh, cohabiting in the same container. And other recent studies are indicating that even like 80% uh, of the containers are co-inhabited by both uh, vectors. Uh, so uh, dealing with one vector at a time might not be like uh, an option. So we need to have like, an integrated vector control uh, program. But most uh, malaria control programs or Ministry of Health don't have this system installed in their uh, si system. Uh, but like uh, countries like Sudan, they already have like integrated vector management uh, department within their uh, min Ministry of Health. Uh, so the, this is one of the things to do. And we, we also have like uh, the, the community, which is the major stakeholder in dealing with uh, such uh, problems. So the community yeah. engagement process, as it was already highlighted in the earlier session about on the EDES uh, topic, is really the most relevant one. So we, we also have like uh, the, the municipalities, uh, we, we have like uh, the, the construction um, ministry or the construction authority because uh, people tend to store water in these settings for the construction purpose and the, the, maybe they, they leave the water storage sites like abandoned when they finish their container. So like uh, enacting by law, uh, by the, the local government in order to do all of this and also engaging the community, the local community and also the international community in dealing with these problems at a time in multi-sectoral and cross-border way is really re relevant. So the community outreach and the engagement uh, is, is the most relevant one for me. So we really need to reach to the community and all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Fitzum. Uh, Fitzum, I wanna stay with you a little bit uh, after uh, the question Sheila asked you. Uh, in, in a recent paper, this is from February this year, uh, you have described laboratory infections of Anopheles stephensi from Ethiopia with P. vivax and P. falciparum. And earlier we had, uh, uh, you know, talk about the rise of P. vivax in the city of Djibouti uh, and, 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 and all that. As an aside, one of the things that also comes out in, in this publication of yours is just the diversity of habitat types. Um, it's, it's very interesting to see that the, the aquatic, the, the ecology is very interesting. But talk to us a little bit about the risk of P. vivax moving into countries where we didn't have as a result of the spread of Nestos, of, of Stephen's Sorry guys, I work on Nestos, so I keep mentioning this. But as with the potential spread of Anopheles stephens eye, will there be a risk of uh, P. vivax spreading beyond its current confines? Yeah, I, I think uh, to, to make a like, comment on your question, Freyros, I have to take the risk that the other vectors that, has, that have existed in the continent were, haven't been like really successful in spreading the, the parasites throughout the continent, but I, I, I wouldn't dare to say that. We, we have like some observations, I can say. There are observations. Like in, in the case of Ethiopia, plasmodium vivax is highly dominant in the country. Like it contributes around 40% of the total case the country reports annually, and also Ethiopia is like contributing 9% of the global plasmodium vivax burden. So the vivax burden is relatively high in Ethiopia. Uh, so the, we, we have Anopheles arabiensis as the major vector. It's uh, really competent in transmitting both falciparum and vivax. So it has been here all the time. And then you find plasmodium vivax more uh, when you go high in the altitude and plasmodium falciparum when you go to the lowland settings. So in the midland settings, you find both species. Uh, but the observations I indicated uh, in my earlier comment in Djibouti city and also in some towns and cities in Sudan is like maybe a recent phenomena, or maybe we just started like looking at it or detecting it because there are also several observations from Africa indicating that plasmodium vivax exists like from parasite identification data, microscopy, RDT, or mosquito data or serological data. So uh, maybe this is just the time we started to look into like plasmodium vivax in the continent. Uh, we haven't tested all the vectors if they are really competent in transmitting plasmodium vivax or yeah. less competent than uh, like their transmission role uh, for plasmodium falciparum. But what we can say definitely is plasmodium uh, anopheles stephensi 
is a stronger vector to transmit plasmodium vivax in our setting than anophila cerevensis. What we did in our study was we collected immature anophila stephensi from uh, the containers, and then we raised them to adults in our laboratory. And then we, in parallel, we had uh, a colony of anophila cerevensis, which has been maintained for years in our laboratory. Then we took blood from patients attending our clinic in, in, in a town called Adama, and then we asked them to give us like five milliliter of uh, venous blood in EDTA and uh, heparin tubes. And then using the heparin uh, bloods, we, we, we put them into membrane feeders connected into water bars. And then we fed the colony mosquitoes maintained in the lab, adapted in the lab, and really efficient in feeding on the artificial membranes and uh, like uh, adjusted <laughs> their within the laboratory. And then at the same time, we used Danuflas Stephensi mosquitoes. So we have done matched membrane feeding experiments with fresh uh, patient drawn blood. And then from these experiments, we have observed that Anophilus stephensi is uh, really highly competent than uh, Anophilus arabiansis, both at the osist stage and also at the sporozoid stage for plasmodium vivax. But our observation for plasmodium falciparum was very limited because uh, the number of cases we find for plasmodium falciparum in our setting is first, it's very low. It's uh, yeah. low in the setting. The other reason is for plasmodium falciparum, the success of transmission in experimental feedings is very low from patients because the gametocyte production uh, process differs between uh, plasmodium falciparum and plasmodium vivax. In vivax, you see gametocytes within two to three days after you see a sexual parasites within the blood. So when you have a patient coming to your clinic with a febrile illness, the patient already has gamut size that can easily be transmitted. And then like in our uh, experiments, like uh, around 70% of random patients infect mosquitoes. But in case of falciparum, the gamut site production rate uh, pr process takes 10 to 12 days. So when you have your patient come into your clinic, unless that patient has stayed at home with the symptom for a long time, uh, and yeah. if the patient comes with acute infection, Acute fever, you, you don't see gametocytes. So it's very, it was very rare to find gametocyte carriers for plasmodium falciparum. So our observation was very strong for plasmodium vivax because of this biological difference. But for plasmodium falciparum, we had very few observations. So we cannot make any conclusion. But for plasmodium vivax, uh, Stephen Tsai was a stronger uh, vector than Arabiansis. Even when after you have like this difference between a wild coat and colony adapted. But when you do like wild caught mosquito for anaphylas arabiansis, they don't even like to feed on your artificial membrane. And then, yeah. so Stephen Tsai is a very strong vector in our uh, city. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, also, I mean, we also don't have, uh, uh, because of the recrudescence in, uh, in Vivax situation, you kind of have it throughout the year if you don't treat it. So if you have Stephen Tsai around throughout the year as well, this probably increases the chances of transmission. I, I want to move this. We have only three additional questions for you guys, and, and, and then we will be done. I want to bring in a, one of the experts on the call. I was looking for Dr. Jerry Klein, but I'm, uh, 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 I'm not sure if he's there. I would like to request either uh, Professor Bart Knolls or Joe Lyons, if they are on the call, to, to help uh, tackle this, this, this question here. So. This is a publication, uh, and Seth Irish is on the call as well. This is a publication from our colleagues. Meshesh already spoke to us uh, from Ethiopia, essentially saying that this, this species is now very widespread in Ethiopia. And we remember the story of uh, the uh, Anopheles Arabiansi or Stroke Gambi in the Brazil area. You know, the first time Fred Sopa goes to tell people, let's open the dikes, let's open the, the, the ocean water into the sea. The, they say no. Six, seven years later, there's no option. They embark on this eradication after the vector has spread widely. Ethiopia is now talking about eliminating an office stiff inside from the area, eradicating it from the area. And I, I would like to invite one of uh, the experts here with you know, history, historical knowledge on how the Brazil program worked and whether this is something that can actually be practical in the Ethiopian setting. So if you, if you guys allow me, I would like to invite either Bart or Joe Lyons uh, to help with it. Um, well, if I, if I may start, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for, for getting me on the call in this way. Um, I, I am not an expert in this. I am I'm basically just focusing on what has been done historically 
um, in the in the uh, occasion when we had this invasion of Nofles Arabiensis in Brazil over an area of 54,000 square kilometers. Now, this this publication that you're showing here is already showing that uh, Stephen's Eye is distributed over a much, much larger area of Ethiopia than the 54,000 square kilometers in which we found Arabiensis in Brazil. Now, nevertheless, that doesn't mean to say that we couldn't stage a similar kind of operation that we staged a long time ago in Brazil and repeat that in one or the other way in, in Anopheles, against Anopheles Stevens Eye in Ethiopia, or the Horn of Africa for that matter. Um, the, the comment that I made in the, in the chat box was to say that we've, we've seen with uh, Aedes albopictus uh, the first outbreak in Genoa in Italy in 1990 and 30 years later, we're now looking at the entire Mediterranean region and major parts of, of Spain, Portugal, um, France being invaded by this mosquito. So basically we've lost the battle. The concern is that if we don't step up and we get in and we manage or we set up a program to try and eliminate Stephen's Eye in the Horn of Africa, that we're, we're gonna reach the stage maybe in two years or five years where we say, oh, now it's so widely distributed, it will never be possible to get rid of it. So. Maybe we are ready too late. Maybe we, we can still do it. And I would say, let's look at the templates of how, um, how it was done in Brazil and see how that can be adapted to present day Ethiopia, Sudan, Djibouti, the countries where we find Stephen's eye at the moment and see how best we can adapt these approaches and apply them again today. Basically, that means training a hell of a lot of people, young people, in identifying the breeding sites that may be occupied by Arabiensis, but at the same time may be occupied by Stephen's eye. If we kill Arabiensis as we do this, it doesn't really matter. We are both, we're tackling both factors at the same time. So staging a very, very large program with hundreds, if not thousands of people trained in doing larva source management, that would be my, my suggestion. Now, obviously that goes along with all of the things that are being discussed here in terms of you know, finding out where are they? How do we identify them? Where, which are the typical breeding sites, et cetera, et cetera. So it's hand in hand research that will, will help us to, to, to stage this massive campaign in order to get rid of it. I don't know, Joe, if you want Thank to add you. to this. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joe, do you want to add or uh, just left? Just probably left, but Eamon, uh, Eman is still with us. Eman, is this a challenge worth taking? Is it feasible? Um, you mean the eliminations of, of no yes, of, of of the invasive Stevenson, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And um, unless the whole um, affected countries with their stakeholders and partners and collaborators uh, uh, align together and we put all our resources expertise and get um, experts from country where I had, uh, have been success in, in eliminating uh, or controlling office even like this challenge is, 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 is gonna re remain. So, and this why at the WHO levels, they um, using that alert and uh, quarterly meetings, coordinating all global partners, we try to, to get this done, however, we still seeking uh, to advocate this with governments and donors, uh, because as my colleague have mentioned before, this will require a hell of training uh, because yeah. um, um, little in, uh, in Africa, they are mainly oriented toward, uh, but with the, the vector control and surveillance, it will toward uh, Gambit. And I guess this is one of, one of the things that has delayed the detection and reporting of an office if, if I uh, timely as in America in some countries is because um, the natural focus of people of um, and going with the assumption that every mosquito we have here is Arabensis, so keep doing usual as uh, business as usual. It, it's one, one of one of the huge problems because when you do that, yeah. you, you will never expect to find something different, and you will never um, be aware of the situation. And that why that was the purpose of of global alert to sensitize yeah. people um, in, in yeah. Africa. And, and I would like to emphasize on this, 
not only for Horn of Africa. Now we're keeping our eye and our thought and our orientations, and we don't need to, to repeat the same mistake again, assuming that this issue is just for um, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Sudan, where an officer has been detected. We don't know yet. It might be have went already further, and uh, the neighbor country might be affected. So we need to 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 act on the three main um, um, uh, arms of uh, this approach: doing uh, enhancing the surveillance in, in country um, where have uh, that have been already uh, reported to determine the, the extent. And enhance the surveillance in the neighboring country where uh, there is high risk of uh, that have been uh, introduced or might be introduced. And also, uh, the second arm is to deploy um, the proper vector control uh, intensively in area where uh, have been uh, reported uh, already. And the third thing is to um, deploy and implement prevention measures in country where have been reported and in border with, um, uh, within, within the country between the state where have been reported or not, and yeah. in border between countries to um, prevent further exportation and importation of these infested vectors. And we need to put all our resources and we need to sensitize the donor, policymaker, public health and um, operational implementer to all work on this. Additionally, also the scientists and researchers in the academic institute who they uh, had additional resources for doing some uh, surveys and technological study. And um, most of the time they, they find the vector um, for uh, the national programs because they don't have the sense of, uh, of routine. They don't um, burden for overwhelmingly under the pressure of doing surveillance every day. So, also, they have their own um, research. So, academic partnership with the academic institute is also crucial for for success. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, our last question is uh, uh, is on the source. So, I think one of the things that many people ask is: Is this something that has been with us for a long time, or is it new? And and to to, to go through this, I mean, here is a publication that came out of Ethiopia as well. And in this, this was the first det detection of uh, of um, of uh, Nofla Stephenson in Ethiopia. And uh, Sarah, would like to hear from you on this actually, because the first description here, and, and Seth Irish, uh, if you like to chip in as well, that, that would be great, suggests that this is very related to the Pakistani populations. Based on this, the group you guys built, you know, two hypotheses was described in this paper. The first is that this Anophila Stephensi was recently introduced into Ethiopia. Second hypothesis was that it has had a presence in Ethiopia for a long time, but was not detected. I think for most people, you want to know whether this is something that is probably already existing in many other cities, but is undetected or not. There is an online preprint right now. I don't know if maybe it's already published. Uh, uh, Sarah, you can uh, help us uh, clarify that. But in this online preprint, you seem to have additional information about the origin uh, of this, linking this much more closely to the Southeast Asian rather than the, the Arabian Peninsula uh, population. What, in your opinion, is the answer to this question? Is this something that has been here with us or is it a recent introduction in the Horn of Africa? Sarah. Thanks. Yeah, I think the work of Tamar Carter has been really, uh, really, really interesting from that first paper and now this, this preprint building off of the questions outlined in the first uh, detection. Um, and in this in this preprint, it, it's not published yet, but is available as a preprint openly, I think. Um, Tamar found really that the, the population genetic data suggests potentially more than one introduction 
into Ethiopia. And it seems as though the source population is like more likely to be from South, uh, South Asia than from the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and I think what's really fascinating about this preprint is this kind of distinction between the population genetics in the, in the Northeast of Ethiopia and then the Southern, uh, the Southeast. Um, so it does seem like it, it's possible that there was more than one introduction, which I think is very good to be aware of and keep in mind when when thinking about how this first came was this, it, it doesn't look like this was a one time introduction that then, you know, spreading. Um, and when thinking about long term plans and control, realizing that there may be continuous introductions is good good to keep in mind so um yeah in her recent work she shows this, these distinct populations so you know it seems like one the one in the in the northeast closer to Djibouti has likely been there for longer than the one in the southeast thank you I think I hope that uh, we will reach a resolution not just for Ethiopia but also for the other countries uh, in the future it would be really, really nice uh, that other countries, um, I always ask whether we have this in Zanzibar already or Dar es Salaam or Mozambique in Maputo. And so on. Uh, one of the things that has come out of this masterclass um, um, is uh, that we need to do more surveillance. I would like to hand this back over to Sheila so that we can close. Uh, Sheila, I think uh, one of the things we can uh, read is, the importance of public engagement as has been raised here. And so, Sheila, back to you, and then we can, we can finalize the, the class. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, I think um, the issue of public engagement and community engagement, when we are thinking about um, the surveillance, both the surveillance and the control of Anopheles Stephensai is, is um, is really huge. Um, Ayman, uh, a question for you. How best can we leverage or involve the community um, in terms of um, ensuring that we actually achieve our planned goal for eliminating Anopheles Tempestai in the Horn of Africa? Uh, I guess, firstly, the, com uh, the community uh, needs to be aware of that there are uh, partner, their main partner in, in achieving this uh, this goal, and it cannot be achieved without their own collaborations. And uh, this could be um, raised in, in several way, either um, by uh, by the inclusions of um, messages and um, raising awareness and information uh, in, uh, in the same uh, risk communication about ADCGI uh, if ever existed. Otherwise, uh, we need to tell a um, standalone message about, um, and uh, also if there's any time, we can establish a new joint message about both, and it's and and uh, Stephen side, and uh, that merely showing that there is, and what could uh, need to be done by both um, uh, the government or the programs and the community, and so in terms the need for uh, yep. using um, sealed uh, container for storing water and uh, the need for uh, to dry uncoverable containers at least once a week and uh, to clean it uh, properly. And um, with, with the training and in the Paris visit and sharing this information and um, explaining that this visit will be a uh, frequent and um, in, in and random, so they will not um, implement this activity just before the visit. And, uh, and also uh, share with them the regulations, established regulations, um, because um, we need to have um, legal legalizations um, for, um, for not pra practicing um, like, um, or implementing these preventive measures. Otherwise, um, uh, we cannot ensure uh, that um, all of the community will adhere to such situations. And in Sudan, this has been um, tried um, early, uh, have been established by Lewis in, in 1947 and have been able uh, to be uh, successful for a certain time where they have established this what's called uh, the dry day, 
was mandatory in, in every farm when, when Khartoum was mainly uh, farms and they were living in the farm. Mm -hmm. So health inspector, um, they visit randomly uh, on, um, on this scheduled uh, days for farm to be dry and they will be fine uh, if uh, the farm owner have been found not um, make the farm entirely dry on this specific day. Yeah. So this, this have, have led to um, the substantial reduction in AIDS decline in, in Khartoum at that time. This have been reinforced in 2014 and now and have been generalized uh, uh, for the whole country and, and uh, IBM Sudan, uh, IBM Development Sudan in 2014 have re-established this rule and established this legalization with um, judiciary uh, authority to be sort of the country. I guess um, all of this combined together and um, with the frequent um, inspections from the surveillance teams and, um, and uh, encouraging the community to adhere to this alliance. And that way we, 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 will, we will ensure the community and uh, with uh, our frequent and random visit, we uh, um, show, showing them that we are committed to this and we need them to be committed to, uh, to this and they will all be on board. And um, the success they will see by themselves by the reductions in, in mosquito um, population, whether in their container or also in their house and during the other surveillance, it will, will reaffirm and, um, and uh, support uh, the main missions. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Eamon, and thanks to everybody. As, as you can imagine, we always have millions of questions. We can't finish them. We've gone three hours already. <laughs> We're going to have to bring this to a close. Uh, a few last words here. Um, um, uh, I want to ask each one of you, each one of our speakers today, starting with Fitzum, then Thara, then Eamon. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if our other colleagues are still there, uh, 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 Peter and, and, and Basil. If you have any final words very quickly, you know, 30 seconds for each one of you. Um, uh, please share those with us uh, as we as we come to the end. Uh, thank you, Fred Ross and colleagues, for organizing this insightful uh, master class. Uh, these are really informative and very well organized and really motivating. And uh, please proceed doing this. And uh, we are always happy to support. And we are thank learning you. a lot from this class. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, thank you also from Peter and from Jeremy. I don't know if Jeremy is still online, but um, it was intriguing to hear the um, update on Aedes and Dengue, but also the, the threat of um, Anopheles Stevens eye. And I think, you know, all of these are invasive species. And I think we've learned before that some early prevention can pay significant benefits as opposed to, you know, waiting for too long. So I think it was great to hear the updates on Stevens eye. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Peter. You or uh, Sarah? Oh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, go ahead. Sarah. <laughs> Just to say thank yeah, like, again, to echo what Fitzsimmons said, thank you so much. And I think, you know, it's it's been really insightful. And, and I think the idea of combining both Aedes and Anopheles Stevens eye, given some of their similarities and, and you know, the threat of, of one kind of new invasive species and one that's um, more longstanding, combining those has been really interesting. And I, I think spreading the word about, about Anopheles Stevens eye in this way has been really excellent. So thank you so much for the invite. I think, you know, the emphasis on communication it from the community level to uh, cross-border collaboration level has been uh, identified here and, and it's really nice to to hear um, all of the experts on the panel and in the chat so thank you so much for putting this together. Welcome. Um, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity and the invitation to um, join um, this very interesting and very helpful master class I, your um, missions and this, uh, through this classes and uh, session, you are delivering such important, um, really needed information for people who have no access 
um, to attend in, in reality or even online or to, to listen to the expert to all bring together. And I was really privileged to be uh, with you and uh, our esteemed colleagues uh, and experts from all, all uh, around the world. And uh, also from the WHO side, I would like to say a huge thank you for helping spreading uh, the message and um, sharing the information about the risk and, and threat of uh, narcissistic side. And now with uh, your support and um, this advocacy and raising awareness, I guess we are uh, getting a, a step uh, further um, to um, for bring everyone together and work on the elimination of anaphysitic anxiety and or at least um, substantially control it in, in Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I don't know if Basil is still with us. Basil is still with us? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, final word, I would really like to request you guys to join me in saying a big thank you to my co-host, Dr. Sheila Ogoma. Uh, uh, Sheila, thank you very much. And uh, we, of course, we're going to have a debrief after this. But uh, a, a quick announcement is that our next masterclass will come at the end of this month. This is next week. Uh, we have to make a confirmation tomorrow, but it is either going to be on love or source management. So this is a very interesting topic. Many people have requested this. Uh, or it's going to be on the genomics of anopheles. So we have to figure out um, um, uh, uh, which one we can, we, can, we can organize. We are sending out word to some of our experts to request their participation. If you have an idea of who, uh, we really would like to hear, for example, from Sudan, uh, because they have done fantastic work there with the public engagement for love of source management. Um, uh, but if you guys have any ideas on how we can make improvements on this, please let Shayla and myself know. And we hope to have a, a, a masterclass on love of source management soon as well. Um, we have a few already that are confirmed, um, uh, but we will let you know that as, 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 as soon as we have confirmations. Once again, uh, thank you so, so, so much. And I would like to hand over back to Sheila to finish the call. Thank you, Fred. Um, a big thank you to our speakers today um, from Dr. Basil, uh, Peter, uh, Eamon, Peter, Sarah. A big thank you to all of you. Thank you so much for um, providing information to us and knowledge and actually getting us thinking, especially about what we need to do about Anopheles Stephensi and how we need to really tackle it. Um, and thank you to the participants and all the other experts that kept the chat really going and very vibrant. And to all of you for joining um, from Fred Ross and I, um, see you next week and thank you once again. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye everybody. The shops are available. If anybody needs them, just let us know as usual. Send send me an email. We will send everything to you. Uh, the file is also live on YouTube. You can watch any other time. Bye bye everybody. And thank you for the presentation. Bye, baby. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Freedom.